Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. Shelley hurriedly put on her robe. She was late for work again today. It was all because of that awful elevator, which was the third time this month that it had failed her. She'd forgotten how many times she'd told herself she wouldn't use it anymore. It would have been all right if someone else had gotten stuck in the elevator. But it always happened only to Shelly. She was especially lucky. Shelly quickly stuffed her things into a bag and then smoothed her beautiful hair. Esther was going to be mad now. And how could she be? She had to start the reception without her. This is unacceptable. You see, how can a doctor sit without a nurse? No, that can never happen. It can't be allowed. Shelley sighed and tried to calm down. She felt the armpits of her gown already soaked. The girl frowned. She wasn't going to go into the office wet and sweaty. She should probably change her robe or dry her armpits somehow. But Shelley discovered she didn't have a spare robe. She had taken it home to wash and never brought it back. Scolding herself, Shelley raised her left hand and bowed her head. After a few seconds, she sighed and stepped toward the door. There was no smell of sweat, and that was good. There was nothing more that could be done anyway. Let it be as it was. It was all the same. Shelley took a brisk step toward the office where Esther was now in charge of the reception. She stopped by the door, on which hung a sign. Before she opened the door, Shelley sighed again. She opened the doors and entered the office. Dr. Esther was sitting at the desk in the doctor's seat, and a patient was sitting in the chair next to her. Esther looked at the girl and grudgingly said, Have you deigned to honor me with your presence, Shelley? Why so early? You should have been here in an hour or two, when I'd have finished the party. What's the big deal? The patient turned to her. Shelley blushed. It was a young man. Esther would have at least waited until the patient was out the door and then told him off in private. Why would she do that? Although Shelley knew the doctor had done it on purpose. She humiliated her in front of the patient on purpose to hurt Shelley. Esther had disliked her from the beginning of the job. Shelley didn't know why, but she suspected it was because of her youth and beauty. Esther herself was 10 years older than Shelley, and her looks really were not so good. And no matter how Esther tried to look younger than her years, she failed. And no matter how much makeup she put on, it didn't make her face prettier. On the contrary, sometimes she looked like a clown. Forgive me, Esther. It won't happen again, Shelley murmured, walking over to her desk. Esther smirked. That's what you said last time. Only nothing's changed. Just like you were late, you're still late. And I had to write two prescriptions with my own hand and one card to fill, she grumbled. Shelley knew that it definitely wouldn't happen again, because she swore to herself that she wouldn't ride that damn elevator that stops at the most inopportune moment. No, it certainly won't happen again, she said firmly. Shelley didn't look at the patient, but she could feel him keeping his eyes on her. It made her feel uncomfortable. And why was he staring at her? Should I tell him to finally stop looking at the girl with his huge eyes? She was only being scolded, there was nothing interesting in that. No, that's out of line. Let him look at Esther, but don't look at the nurse. Esther took one more stern look at her nurse and then squared her shoulders and smiled, turning to the patient. Well, Mario, you know what I mean. You have to take care of yourself from a young age, especially if you don't have someone to take care of you. You know, some men are lucky to have wives who are doctors. You can't get lost with wives like that. Just don't think, I'm not talking about me. I don't have and don't expect to have one. As long as I'm a completely free woman. So, my dear, I'll tell you this. I'm a little concerned about your tests. I'm going to prescribe you something. One drug, so to speak, only it has a side effect, but it does not work badly on everyone. I'll give you my phone number. You take the pills for two or three days, and then call me, so as not to go to the appointment for nothing, and tell me how you feel. 
If anything is wrong, I'll give you other appointments. It was only now that Shelley realized that there was another reason Esther had behaved this way to her in front of a patient. It became clear that she was trying to charm the man and wanted to show him what an important person she was, she could scold the nurse like a little child. Esther was just flirting with him, trying to get his attention. Apparently, she likes him very much, if she is going to give him her phone number. She doesn't give her phone to just anyone. Esther finally sees that all the man's attention is on the nurse, and the doctor frowns when she realizes that Shelley is interested in him. Once again, this upstart is trying to cross the road. This must not be allowed to happen. It must be stopped now. Of course, Shelley wasn't going to cross anyone, and she wasn't going to drag this patient or anyone else to her attention at all, but Esther kept thinking that Shelley was putting herself above her. In fact, Esther had long wanted to get married, and she often chose her patients to marry. Except it had been a long time since there had been a newcomer, unmarried, and so handsome. Esther wasn't about to let go of her prey without a fight. Shelly, go to the registrar's office, find me the cards of Lukyanov, Denisenko, and Shepeyev. Quickly. Ordered Esther. Shelly immediately got up and left. And even near the door the girl felt the man's gaze on her back. When Shelly left, the man turned to Esther. Yes, I understand you, write a prescription. If something goes wrong, I'll better come to you for an appointment. It will be more reliable. Esther, not a telephone conversation about treatment. Esther kept smiling. But she had already realized that it was impossible to capture the patient's attention. And all because of that Shelley. She would have been better off really being 15 more minutes late. Of course, you can come to me any day during my appointment hours but I'll write down my number just in case. Anyway, you know, all sorts of situations happen. Maybe I could need you at night, too." Mario looked at the doctor and could hardly keep from laughing. Of course, he knew that the painted woman was trying to draw him in, and at first it amused him. He even decided to support her game, and several times he smiled invitingly, letting her know that he was interested in her. The doctor swallowed the bait and was already dreaming. Except that after Mario saw the pretty nurse, he immediately lost interest in Esther. If he had had in mind the idea of meeting the doctor and spending time with her, he now had a very different idea. Esther was not part of those plans at all. After he talked with the doctor for a few minutes, Mario hurried to leave. Esther tried her best to hint that she would wait for his call. She was batting her eyes and moving her eyebrows, and he couldn't take it anymore. When he got out of the office he saw that a long line had gathered. Everyone was looking at him with a disgruntled look, trying to understand why such a young man and so much time in the doctor's office. Mario nonchalantly pushed past everyone and went to the front desk. Behind the counter sat a full registrar with an unpleasant expression on her face. She was busily flipping through a magazine and sighing as if she were doing me a favor by sitting there. It was as if she were not performing her duties, but simply condescended to this place. Mario started looking for the nurse, whose name was Shelley, but didn't see her. The receptionist looked at him and raised her eyebrows. What do you want? Mario wanted to say that he was looking for a nurse, but he knew by the look on this formidable woman's face that she would never answer any of his questions out of spite. Nothing, I've already found everything, Mario replied and walked towards the exit of the clinic. The woman hummed loudly and said, What a fool. He stood and stood and then he left. And what did you stand there for? Tell me. What kind of day is today? It's all jerks today, all of them. Is that what you're saying to me? Came Shelley's voice from behind the shelves of cards. No, Shell, not you. Shelley still couldn't find the cards with the right names on them. Losing all hope of finding them, she returned to the study. As it turned out, the cards were on Esther's desk, and the doctor supposedly didn't know that. But Shelley realized that she knew all too well that she had simply escorted her out of the office to talk to a patient. Esther was not in the mood for the rest of the day. And Shelley breathed a sigh of relief when the workday was over. 
After finishing all her chores, filling out her charts, and cleaning up her office, Shelly got ready to go home. As she walked out of the clinic, she didn't immediately notice the man blocking her way. It was only when she ran into him that she gave a startled gasp. Excuse me, I didn't see you. Why are you standing so close to the door? I could have hit you with the door if I had opened it wider. The man held her up so she wouldn't fall down the steps. I was just trying to keep you out of the way. Shelly frowned and immediately moved away from him. Looking around for someone to turn to for help, Shelly found that no one was around. As luck would have it, there wasn't a soul around. Me? What's that all of a sudden, she stretched out uncertainly, stepping slightly aside. Don't be afraid, Shelly, I won't hurt you. I only wanted to walk you home, if you'll let me. Shelly realized with surprise that the man knew her. But from where? She saw him for the first time in her life. And only then did she recognize him. It was the same patient who had been sitting at Esther's when she scolded her for being late. Ah. It's you. I didn't recognize you at first, she then looked at him silently, not knowing what to answer. And then she decided that since Esther had humiliated her so, Shelly would do the same to her. She would agree to have Mario escort her, even if Esther didn't find out about it. All right, walk me home if you like. And as they walked to Shelly's house, the girl realized that Mario was very interested in her. And when he asked her out, she said yes. And so they began to meet. Naturally, for a long time Shelly hid her relationship with Mario at work. It was not customary to make acquaintances, to maintain personal relationships with patients. It was not welcomed. Moreover, Shelly was afraid of Esther. She couldn't even think how the doctor would react when she found out that Shelly had stolen a potential suitor from her. Shelly didn't steal him, though. It just happened on its own. But Shelly soon breathed a sigh of relief. Three months after Shelly began dating Mario, Esther met a visiting guy who came for a three-month business trip. It just so happened that he fell ill and came to their clinic. And the strange thing was, he really liked Esther. When it was time for the man to return home, he invited Esther along, asking her to marry him. And Esther agreed. Soon there was another doctor on the fourth station. A couple of months later, Mario proposed to Shelly and she happily said yes. Mario and Shelly had a modest wedding. They both decided it was pointless to spend money on a celebration. Shelly sold her tiny little apartment, and they invested all the money in a nice renovation of Mario's apartment, and the rest of the money went to buy a car. Everyone told Shelly not to sell her apartment, because she had nothing of her own left. And her husband's apartment was his personal property. But Shelly trusted her husband completely. They were so close that they had no secrets from each other, no reticences. A little more time passed, and Shelly realized that she was pregnant. At first she was a little frightened, because she and Mario hadn't discussed this moment until now. Of course, they, like any other spouses, would like their family to be bigger. But Shelly was afraid her husband would say it was too soon. Shelly knew she couldn't have an abortion. And what would they do if Mario insisted that it was too soon for them to have children? It wasn't too early, though, since Shelly was already 26 years old and Mario was in his 30s. But Shelly knew that Mario could tell that they were still just enjoying each other. But Mario, thank God, said nothing of the sort. He was excited that they were about to have a baby. Shelly breathed a sigh of relief. She happily watched her growing belly, watched the changes in her figure, counting the days until the birth. And with what pleasure she went into maternity. She did not even think about the fact that on maternity leave she would receive very little. She thought only of the happy days and nights ahead of her with her baby. Shelly gave birth on time. The birth went safely. Shelly was asked by an acquaintance to let her husband be present at the birth, but Mario did not want to. So Shelly was the first to pick up her baby. It was a girl. She held her in her arms and, dropping tears of happiness, whispered to her, you are going to be the happiest girl in the world. And you will have the best daddy in the world. I promise you. They named the baby girl Gail. 
A couple of days later, Mario picked up his wife and daughter from the maternity hospital. And the mother's routine began. And every night, putting her daughter to bed and looking at her husband, who was already asleep and had to get up early for work in the morning, Shelley thanked fate for having such a good family. Shelley went through the entire stack of papers. She didn't seem to have forgotten anything. And if she had forgotten, she would tearfully beg the nursery manager to make concessions, too. It turned out to be too nerve-wracking to get her child ready for kindergarten. Shelley had no idea how much stuff was needed, papers, statements, certificates. Frowning, she slammed the file and put it in her bag. Well, we have to go, so we won't be late. Shelley was warned that if she wanted her daughter to be identified as a good caregiver, she had to start with the headmistress. If the supervisor doesn't like her from the start, she won't get any favors or privileges. Shelley picked up a nice paper bag. She had a nice present for the manager, a bottle of expensive champagne, a box of good chocolates, and two bars of luxury chocolates. She wanted to add a bottle of cognac to all this, but Mario objected. Wow. It's like going to a job interview. What kind of offerings are so expensive? She hasn't done anything for you yet and you're already carrying bags. The reason I'm carrying them is so she can do something for me. And you, Mario, you'd better stay out of it. But she didn't put down the cognac after all. A couple of hours later Shelley returned home in a great mood. Her husband had already come home from work. He looked at Shelley with surprise. Where's Gail? Shelley smiled and replied cheerfully, she's at her neighbor's. I'll go and get her now. I left her with her for a couple of hours to go out on some important business. Do you know where I've been? And where, Mario asked. In the kindergarten. I was talking to the principal. And I was very lucky today. I brought all the documents I needed. She liked my present, that's for sure. I could see it in her eyes. And she assigned Gail to the coolest kindergarten teacher. You can imagine, we're very lucky. Mario grinned, looking at his wife. How lucky is that? I'll tell you now, that's real luck. Are you ready to hear the news? Shelley lowered her eyebrows in surprise. She was curious as to what her husband was going to tell her. Come on, talk fast, she replied. Mario smiled and, after a solemn pause, said, A couple of months ago, a new employee came in. And a couple of days ago, he and I got to talking. I found out that his wife is the director of a private nursing home. Can you believe that? Shelley looked at her husband in bewilderment. Yes, I can't even imagine. Mario, what's the big deal? Are you kidding me? Why are you telling me all this? Why should I care about a new employee who works as a director in a nursing home? Mario hummed and rolled his eyes. You don't understand. Come on, I can explain. I talked to him and asked him to ask his wife if there were any openings in the nursing home. Why did you ask that? asked Shelley in surprise. Mario shook his head. How long it takes you to understand? Because he told me how much a regular nurse makes. And that it's almost double what you got at the clinic. I wanted to see if they had a spot. And guess what, there is. There's an opening for a nurse. That's great, isn't it? Shelley finally understood what he was getting at. She frowned slightly and asked quietly, I don't think I asked you to look for a place for me. I work in a clinic, actually. Or did you forget? And why are you looking for a place for me if I didn't ask you to? Her tone didn't much please Mario, but he decided to be more affectionate with his wife to coax her. Well, Shelley, I understand. But think about it, your salary is twice as much as yours at the polyclinic. Don't you want to make more? You can save for the future. You should always take advantage of the opportunities that destiny gives you. Isn't that the right thing to do? You should listen to me. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Shelley frowned even more. Somehow she had no intention of changing jobs. She was basically happy with the salary and the schedule. 
move to a new place? What if she didn't like it there? What if it was much worse? Maybe the pay isn't as good as her husband says it is. Maybe it was just their way of luring in new employees. Shelly shook her head and objected. Mario, you don't know what you're talking about. Now Gail's going to kindergarten, she's going to be sick. I'll have to take sick leave to take care of her. And if I work at the clinic, it won't be that hard to do. But if I go to a new job, it is fraught with the fact that I won't get sick leave. Especially if it's a private institution. Or they'll give me sick leave, but they won't pay me. And then what's the point of it all? I'd rather sit in a nurse's position than chase the money. Shelly, you should at least go over there and ask for the terms. I've already asked Beverly to take you in. What do you have to do, just go there. Maybe you'll like it and you'll want to go there. Please don't let me down. I've already made arrangements. Of course, Shelly was terribly angry with Mario for arranging everything without her knowledge. But she honestly wondered what a private nursing home looked like. Did such an institution really provide proper care for the elderly, or was it all a fairy tale and fiction? And Shelley agreed to just go to a meeting with the director, not even thinking that anything could change her mind. However, things didn't go the way Shelley had imagined. As soon as she entered the establishment, she was struck by the size, the interior decoration and furnishings, and the courteous staff. But most of all she was struck by the courtyard. It was so beautiful. It wasn't just an institution for people to die here, forgotten by relatives or relatives. It wasn't a place to hide someone who couldn't care for themselves. It was a place where the elderly could live the rest of their lives with dignity, without worrying about having no one to fetch a glass of water or call an ambulance to call for help if needed. It was the same place where seniors could take care of nothing. There were special people taking care of everything. And there was so much staff here, it seemed like the residents themselves were less. And when Shelley walked into the medical care sectors, she almost gasped. Modern equipment, beautiful bright rooms, medicines, all other equipment, everything was of the highest order. Yes, it was a real pleasure to work here. A nurse here probably does not act as a nurse, as sometimes happens in ordinary hospitals. Here, the nurse gives injections, performs necessary procedures, performs dressings, and looks after patients while they are in the outpatient section. A physical therapy room nurse was needed. This was the position that Shelley was offered. When Shelley came to see the director, she was already questioning whether or not she wanted to change her position as a nurse in the outpatient department. Beverly was very arrogant. As Shelley later learned, this woman was not often in the field. You could tell she was hard to get a hold of. She always ran everything remotely, coming into the establishment only when necessary. She looked as if she had been torn away from something important. And Shelley didn't like her very much. Shelley realized that dealing with her would be very difficult. Beverly looked Shelley over carefully, asked her some questions, and by the way she looked at her approvingly, Shelley knew she had passed the test. The principal liked her. Beverly said that Shelley could begin her duties in two weeks. Just in time for that nurse who was quitting. When Shelley asked the reason for firing that nurse, Beverly raised one eyebrow. From the look on her face, Shelley knew she shouldn't have asked that question. No doubt I won't have to answer that question, as it's none of your business. But since you're here on recommendation, I'll tell you one thing, that girl isn't quitting. She's just going to another city. And just so you know, we haven't had a single person quit on their own accord here. You don't just walk out of here, you have to get fired for something. That's what I'm telling you for the future. Also, if you are going to work, make sure that your health record book is in order. We're strict about that. If you don't have one, we won't hire you. And Shelley agreed to work in a nursing home. And she didn't even ask about sick leave and vacation time. She didn't even specify the exact salary she would receive. She didn't care anymore, she liked the place so much. Shelley took care of all the business of quitting her job at the clinic. Gail started going to kindergarten. And so gentle was her daughter's adjustment that Shelley didn't even realize anything. 
it was as if Gail had been in kindergarten for a year and there were no addictions or endless sicknesses, no tantrums or tears. Everything was going well. And soon Shelley began her new job, too, and she plunged headlong into her new responsibilities. She was trained on the equipment and told how each physical therapy machine worked. Shelley quickly got into everything, and she was excited to go to work because she had never been more interested and excited. And she became very fond of the old people who lived in the nursing home. They were almost all intelligent, interesting people. She especially enjoyed chatting with a few of them. There was Megan, who had worked as a ballerina when she was young. Oh, what stories she told Shelley. There was also Bob, who had worked all his life as a chief engineer in a factory and never had a wife and children. Now he had voluntarily placed himself here on his own, so that at least the rest of his life he wouldn't be all alone. And he wooed a woman, wishing that she would be his companion for the time they still had left. And then there was Ian, who was a writer. He didn't have enough time to start a family either. He spent his whole life writing books, manuscripts, essays, and stories of his own. Shelley was very kind. Everyone loved her and treated her well, and Shelley never hurt anyone. On the contrary, she tried to make time for everyone. Because of her kind heart and beauty, the old folks nicknamed her Cinderella. Shelley first asked that she not be called that, but no one listened to her. So she put up with it. Only one person didn't like Shelley. It was another nurse, her name was Regina. She had worked here ever since the place opened. And that was a little over 10 years. Regina thought she was the most important person here, since she had worked here for so long. And she thought everyone should listen to her. Disliked Regina Shelley because Shelley didn't listen to her once. Regina once told her not to get so close to the guests as if they were her friends. You have to be as polite and smiling and courteous as possible, that's all. Anything else would be superfluous. And Shelley talked to them as if they were all her close relatives. Regina was annoyed by this. But what pissed Regina off even more was that not only did Shelley not listen to her, but she made a different point. And I think we should be affectionate and gentle and friendly with them. Don't you think these elderly people think of us as their families? They talk to us as if we were their children or grandchildren. They crave companionship because they themselves are lonely. Is it so hard to give them what they need? It was after that conversation that Regina harbored a grudge against Shelley. She thought that someday she would get the chance to put the upstart in her place. And she was going to take that chance. And Shelley had no idea that Regina was trying to set her up. She just enjoyed her work and the company of interesting, though rather old people. Two years passed. During that time Shelley got so used to her job that she no longer even remembered working as a nurse at the clinic. Gail enjoyed going to kindergarten. Adaptation at the beginning went well. Gail was still almost never sick, and Shelley didn't have to go on sick leave. With Mario everything was smooth and calm. Yes, their relationship was no longer the same as when they first met. The passion had subsided a little, but that was how it was for everyone. Shelley was sure that she and Mario loved each other, and that was the most important thing, and passion eventually fades. One day Shelley came home from work particularly tired and upset. Anne had died today. She had lived in the nursing home almost from the beginning and was already 98 years old. She was the oldest of all the residents. Shelley felt so sorry for this old lady. So what if she wasn't alone? So what if she had people around to help her if she needed it? That wasn't all it was. Whenever Shelley saw this old woman, she noticed that she always had a poker face and that she missed her family. All of her relatives were long dead. And had lived longer than all of them. Not far from the nursing home were garbage cans. The place was very attractive to the local homeless. Garbage from the nursing home and several stores was taken there. There were leftovers of decent food, lots of expired groceries, and all sorts of other things that appealed to attractive people with questionable reputations. Several times Shelley saw someone rummaging through a trash can. But as soon as she got close, those unsavory individuals immediately evaporated. Either they were afraid of her, or they just didn't want to show their faces. 
but today Shelley saw there a man she had never seen before. And he did not hide from her when she came closer. He just lowered his head and waited for her to pass by. Shelley tossed the bag of garbage and hesitated slightly. She glanced sideways at the man. She knew right away that he was homeless, because he was sprawled out on a cardboard table which he had laid out behind the trash cans. Beside him stood a squat cart with his small set of belongings on it. It was impossible to determine his exact age. He was gray-haired and bearded. The beard hid his face almost completely, but somehow Shelley didn't think he was too old. He still sat with his head bowed and unmoving. Shelley had already walked past him, but then, after taking a couple of steps, she stopped and looked back. The man had already stood up and walked over to the trash can, peering into it. Shelley shook her head slightly. For some reason she felt so sorry for him. She'd seen people like him before, but no one had ever made her feel so sorry for him. And Shelley understood why. The others were ordinary. They looked like wild animals, frightened animals. There was almost nothing human about them. And this bum hid his gaze when she stepped closer to him, as if he was not just hiding, but wanted to appear inconspicuous so as not to offend Shelley's sense. It was as if he knew he was disgusted by his own appearance. This both delighted Shelley and amazed and pitied him. What had happened to him that he was in such a situation? He didn't seem like a drunk or a drug addict. Shelley sighed and took a few steps toward the garbage cans. The man had already begun carefully rummaging through the bags that Shelley had just thrown in. There's nothing there to eat, unfortunately, Shelley pronounced. The man took his hand away from the bag of garbage and looked at Shelley fearfully. Then he lowered his gaze. He waited silently for her to leave. I'm sorry I startled you. You know, if you want, I can bring some food tomorrow in another bag. If you'll be here, I'll give it to you. We always have leftovers. A lot of people even take something home. I could bring you some. The man looked at her very carefully. Shelley saw a sincere interest in his eyes. Why do you want to help me? Don't you understand who I am, he asked. His voice was low, but he spoke the words clearly. For some reason Shelley thought this man must be educated. She shrugged. What's the big deal? If I can help, why not? It's not hard for me at all. There's so much food being thrown away anyway. If it can help you, why not? You don't have to go through the trash, I'll bring you a separate bag tomorrow. The man nodded. I'll be here. I have nowhere else to go. Shelley nodded as well, turned around, and went home. At home, Shelley immersed herself in household chores. Then she had a slight argument with Mario. He claimed that she had spoiled Gail too much and now the girl was not listening to her or him. Then she couldn't get her daughter to bed for a long time. After her parents fought, she was overexcited. Domestic chores prevented her from thinking about anything. After working the next day, Shelley went home, remembering to take a bag for the homeless man. She packed a lot of food. He would even have enough for a few days. When she approached the garbage cans, she saw no one. She stood at a loss. Not knowing what to do with the bag, she hung it on a hook on the bin. Maybe he'll find it when he comes. Or maybe someone will beat him to it. Or maybe the dogs sniff faster, too. For the next few days, Shelley didn't walk past the garbage cans. And the next time she walked by, she saw the man. This time he didn't hide his eyes when she approached. Thank you, he said, I found your bag of food. I guessed you left it for me. I really appreciate it. Shelley smiled and reached into her bag. She pulled out two chocolate bars. She held them out to the homeless man. Take it. I have nothing else to give you, she thought he would refuse the chocolate, but he didn't. He immediately unwrapped one of the chocolates and took a bite with pleasure. Why do you live on the street, she asked Shelley abruptly. The man looked at her sideways and smirked. I think it's obvious. Why do people live on the streets? So they don't have a home to live in. 
Shelly looked at him thoughtfully, then asked again. What's the matter with you that you don't have a home? I guess you weren't always homeless. That's right, and the man told her that he hadn't always been homeless. His name was Timothy. He was successful and he had a family. He married a woman whose name was Eva. Eva already had a daughter from her first marriage. Timothy, on the other hand, had no children and had never had a wife before. It was years later that Timothy realized that Eva had married him because he was an eligible groom. He had no more heirs, no more relatives. But he had a nice two-bedroom apartment in the center, a car, a cottage. His daughter grew up very capricious, her character was affected by her mother's upbringing. And when the daughter grew up, she left her parents' home. She married a foreigner and moved to Europe. She had no contact with Timothy, only with her own mother. And then his wife cheated him. She cheated him out of everything, his apartment, his cottage, his car. She forged his signature and soon filed for divorce. And then she kicked Timothy out of his own house. Of course, Timothy could have had a showdown, tried to prove that his wife was a cheater, but he didn't. He loved his wife. Yes, he loved her a lot. And he couldn't even imagine how she would go to such lengths to cheat. He thought the whole thing was some kind of scary dream. It wasn't until he was right out on the street that he woke up, but there was nothing he could do. And he didn't even want to later. How unfair. And why is she doing this to you? What have they done to her, she asked. Timothy shrugged his shoulders, wrapping himself in his jacket. I didn't do anything. I just loved her and carried her in my arms. She just didn't love me and decided to let it go. Soon after I was on the street, she sold all the property she had taken from me and went to her daughter in Europe. And I was left all alone, no family, no money, no possessions, no job. Just without anything. Shelley became sorry for him you know. You must have done it wrong. You should have tried to prove right away that she was a fraud. And it would have been all right. Timothy shook his head. Maybe I should have, but I don't know that it would have worked out. My wife had a lot of good connections. And if she wanted to, she could get help from people I never dreamed of. I'm not sure I could have proved anything if she had set out to destroy me. I only later realized that I was still lucky. She could have just killed me. That's the way it is, Shelley. They talked some more. Then Shelley left, promising that she would bring him food all the time and that she would also bring him some warm clothes. Winter was coming. It would be too cold to sleep outside. He needed lots of warm clothes to somehow survive outside. Before that, he had slept in the basement of a house for several years. It was warm and nice there, but then the tenants discovered him and they locked the basement. So he was left with both no belongings and no place to sleep. Soon Shelley began to stay for night shifts. There were always two night nurses. They always took turns only going out at night. But they both got sick. So Shelley, along with Regina, took turns going out at night. It was Shelley's turn. It was a particularly cold day. Shelley went out a little early. She was going to see Timothy. She was carrying him a thin blanket. In this wind, maybe it would do him some good. It would at least cover his head. But as soon as Shelley got to the trash cans, she saw Timothy lying on the ground. Timothy. What's wrong, yelled Shelley and ran to him. She started to wake him up. He was alive. It turned out that one of the other homeless people had stolen his shopping cart while he was rummaging through a dumpster near Central Market. All his stuff was in there. He was left with nothing. He barely made it here, and then he collapsed and passed out in helplessness. If Shelley hadn't found him, or if she had come a little later, he would have frozen to death. Shelley saved him. She looked at the frozen man with his lips turned blue and didn't know what she should do. If she left him here now and left, he would just freeze to death. She couldn't let him die. That was simply unacceptable. Is it okay to leave a man in trouble if he has nowhere else to go for help? Shelley just couldn't be so heartless with him. 
She had to do something to help him, and Shelley decided that she would help him, no matter what it cost her. She held out a blanket to him. Take this. It's a good thing I got it, or you'd be freezing for sure. Wrap yourselves up and come with me. Timothy was surprised. Where should I go and why? Do I have to follow you? His tongue was slurring, and he could hardly speak because he was shaking unbelievably. Don't ask unnecessary questions. Just follow me, and then I'll tell you everything, and Shelley led him toward the nursing home. Near the building itself, she looked around and launched him inside the garden, hiding him behind a large tree near the building. She told him not to go outside, and to wait for her. The homeless man promised not to show himself. Shelley herself went to change. Regina was filling out some paperwork. As soon as she saw Shelley, she immediately put down her pen and papers. Oh, great. You're early today. That's good. I'll just run along then. I have to run to a place on some very important business. You don't mind, do you? Of course Shelley didn't mind. It was a very good situation for her. Once Regina was gone, she could launch a homeless man to spend the night in the warmth of this cold, windy night. Yes, of course. Go right now. I'll change in a minute and get to my post. There hasn't been any incident? Regina shook her head. No, all is quiet. The old folks are all resting in their rooms. Don't forget to go around and put them to bed in an hour. Shelley frowned. I told you not to call them that insulting. Regina hummed, but didn't say anything back. After ten minutes, Regina left. Shelley waited another five minutes, and then she threw her jacket on and went out into the yard. She found a homeless man behind a tree and led him inside. Once she got him inside, she closed the door behind her and turned around. She was at a loss for words. In front of her stood Regina. She was staring at Shelley and at the homeless vagrant with gaping eyes. Her face was full of perplexity. She obviously did not understand what was going on. It wasn't until a couple of minutes later that Regina realized that she had seen Shelley at the scene of the crime. A look of genuine amazement came over her face. Shelley. What are you doing? Are you out of your mind, she said. Shelley put her index finger to her lips. I'm just asking you not to make a fuss. There's no need to panic. Everything is under control. Regina shook her head in shock and pointed squeamishly at the homeless man. Everything is under control? Is that what you call it? You bring a homeless man in here and tell me it's all under control? Shelley, you're out of your mind. That's what I'm saying. Quiet. I said be quiet. I'll explain everything to you. I don't even want to hear about anything. Don't drag me into this. I'm not going to take orders from you. You're going to get me into trouble. No, I'm not going to get in trouble. It's your responsibility. In fact, get him out of here right now. If anyone finds out you brought him here, we'll all be in trouble. But Shelley shook her head and said firmly, No, Regina, I won't throw him out. Let him sleep here tonight. I'll let him out in the morning. It is so cold outside. If he stays there, he will freeze to death. That's for sure. Regina got angry and hissed at Shelley. What do we care if he freezes or not? We have to think of ourselves. Do you have any idea what will happen if they find out about your companion? And they will find out for sure. I'm telling you. Even the walls have ears. Shelley became angry with her. She pushed Timothy toward the nearest door and stepped close to Regina. What you say won't make any difference. I advise you to go away. Pretend you didn't see anything. Let it all be on my conscience. Just go home or wherever it is you're going. You'd better stay out of my way. I'll do as I see fit. Do you understand? Regina squinted. No one had ever spoken to her like that before. Regina expected Shelley to listen to her and kick the homeless man out. 
but Shelley was persistent. Regina didn't like it very much, and she realized that she wanted to teach Shelley a lesson for it. And let her revenge be too cruel, but Regina had already decided that she would do it. All right, whatever you say. I'll go, and you do as you please. Don't say I didn't warn you. Anything can happen. Shelley waved her off and headed toward the homeless man. Looking after her, Regina smiled ominously. We'll see who's right. You shouldn't have done something against my will, Shelley. You will be sorry. It will only be too late. Regina left, and Shelley set Timothy up in the back room. She spread a blanket for him on the floor, and then she carried him his food. Then the man, full and warm, fell asleep peacefully. And Shelley, having calmed down, went to her post. Her soul was now at peace. She had saved this unfortunate man from certain death. And she was happy that she had brought him here. Nothing would happen from one night. Especially, no one would ever know about anything. Shelley was a little worried, of course, that Regina had seen them. But she reassured herself that she had shut Regina up. Let her be so unhappy. That was her problem. But Shelley was wrong. She only made Regina angry. And as soon as Regina got home, she immediately made one single phone call. When she finally got an answer, she immediately said, Beverly. Good night. I'm sorry to bother you so late. It's very important. It's so important that it can't wait, Regina said. Beverly sighed and replied menacingly, You can only alarm me this late if the question is life or death. Is the information so important that you want to tell me that you wake me up at night? Or are you just playing around? Regina turned pale. If she didn't tell her what it was now, Beverly would just hang up on her and then she would be fired for her insolence. Yes, it's a matter of life and death. It's about the nursing home. Terrible things are happening there right now. You should know about it. What is it? What kind of horrible things? Talk quickly. Shelley brought a homeless man into the nursing home. She let him stay there overnight. She put him in one of the rooms reserved for residents. I tried to stop her. I told her it was forbidden, but she wouldn't listen. She did it her way, and then she insulted me. That made me very angry. Such blatant disregard for the rules. I thought you should know about it, so that you could take the necessary measures and punish this wayward and disobedient girl without delay." Regina spoke up and was silent for a while. Beverly was silent. Then she said sternly, that's how it is, then. So she felt sorry for the homeless man. Well, she'll regret it herself. Don't you worry, Regina. I'm going right now and I'll get there. Go back there, too. You'll have to work the night shift tonight, because that nurse won't be in my facility anytime soon. Regina passed out, and a smile lit up her face. She had done her job. Now Shelley would be fired. Shelley dozed a little at her desk. Then she suddenly woke up and looked at her watch. It was two o'clock in the morning. Shelley listened. There was silence. Only the occasional snore could be heard. Shelley smiled. It was so nice at night and quiet and peaceful. Suddenly, Shelley heard a noise. She frowned. The noise came from the street, as if someone had slammed the doors. But she was closing the doors. Could it be thieves? She was just about to pick up the phone to dial security when she saw the principal appear in the hallway. Yes, there was Beverly. Shelley couldn't believe her eyes. It wasn't until she saw the figure of Regina behind her that Shelley realized everything. It was the nasty Regina who had told her everything. She handed everything over to the director to remove all suspicion from her. Shelley realized that she was in serious trouble. And now there is no telling what will happen next. However, it would soon be known. Beverly walked over to the desk where Shelley was sitting and said, Well, where did you hide that creature? Shelley opened her mouth, but said nothing. Maybe say she just fed it and sent it back outside. And Regina just lied to piss her off. 
What if Beverly does a search? She'd find him anyway, and then it would be even worse. How about just coming clean and apologizing? Sincerely repent of everything, without hiding anything. Maybe Beverly would take pity on her. Why aren't you saying anything? Where has your courage gone, said Beverly loudly. Shelley looked at Regina, who was standing just behind the principal. Regina looked at her with triumph. Though she realized that she had done it on purpose. What a brute! She had been waiting for this moment to set her up. I put him in the back room. I took him there right away, Beverly, he didn't go anywhere else. I just laid him there on the floor on my blanket I brought from home. I just let him wait out the wind and the cold, and he'd leave early in the morning. He just had all his stuff stolen, and he would have frozen in the street. Honestly, I decided to help him. I couldn't leave him out in the street to die, could I? Beverly looked at Shelley and didn't know what to say. Finally she said, Are you kidding me? How could you possibly think that I would be interested in all this? Why did you tell me all this? You think you're going to make me feel better? You shouldn't. There are rules that everybody has to follow. No outsiders are allowed in the establishment, especially at night. And you didn't just bring a stranger, you brought a bum. Shelly, you're crazy. I don't know. I've come to throw that creature out of my establishment. Bring him here right now. Now. Otherwise I'll call the police. And tell him to behave himself, because there are guards on the doorstep. If he starts making noise or resisting, I'll call them and they'll beat him up. Shelly went after the homeless man. When she woke him up, she told him, We're in trouble. My boss found out you were here. She is furious. You need to get out of here as quickly as possible. Just be quiet, or she'll call the guards on you. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about what happened. I just wanted to help you. Shelly, I'm the one who owes you an apology. I got you into trouble. I felt I shouldn't have agreed to all this. I should have thought of you, not myself. Because of some homeless man you now have to account for. A few minutes later Shelly brought Timothy in. Beverly looked at him squeamishly and briefly ordered, Get out of here now. And don't you ever come near our place again. Timothy looked at Shelly. She nodded at him and pointed to the door. He walked toward the exit. And Shelly remained standing where she was. As soon as he left, Beverly turned to Shelly and said, Now let's decide with you. I'm sorry, Beverly, it won't happen again. I realized my mistake. I'll never do it again, Shelly hurriedly apologized. Beverly smiled affectionately. This brought hope to Shelly's soul. Maybe she would really forgive her for once. But as soon as Beverly opened her mouth and said a few phrases, Shelly realized her mistake. Of course, dear, of course, Shelly, it won't happen again. Do you know why? Because you're fired. You have to leave now. And don't ever come back. You'll be credited for the time you've worked, subject to a fine for such misconduct, of course. Leave. What, whispered Shelley. That you heard. Go away now. Otherwise I'll call the police, Beverly said quickly. Shelley left, swallowing her tears. She went outside, hoping Timothy was still around. But he was nowhere to be found. The wind hadn't died down yet. Shelly pulled her scarf tighter and hurried to the garbage cans, but the bum wasn't there either. He had simply vanished. Shelly stood for a few minutes, looking around, and then realized she had to go home. She shouldn't have stayed on the street at this hour. She hailed a cab and drove home. She carefully opened the front door so as not to disturb her husband. She lay down on the couch and immediately fell asleep. She woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning. There was no more sleep and she decided to get up and make breakfast. While making breakfast, she calmed down a bit. All she did was get fired. It was no big deal. She would find another job. And it wasn't such a big deal. And it was a good thing she had been fired. 
She no longer wanted to work in that place, where the director had no sense of compassion at all. Why are you home so early, she heard her husband's voice. She turned toward the door. Mario was standing there, sleepy and surprised. Now she would tell him everything, and he would support her. Shelley was sure of it. As it happened. Mario, a whole story happened to me last night. Mario frowned. What happened? Shelly spread her arms and said, I got fired. Mario, I was fired in the middle of the night. I'm a free bird now. That's the way it is. Mario opened his eyes wide. What did you get fired for? What happened, he asked in shock. And Shelly told him everything. She didn't withhold anything. She told everything from the beginning, how she started helping the bum with food and things, to tonight. When she stopped talking, she smiled. Can you imagine, they fired me because of a little thing like that. I helped an old man, even though he was homeless. It was my duty. I couldn't let him die. I did what I had to do. And Beverly didn't support me. Mario stepped closer to her and grabbed her shoulder painfully. What are you doing? Mario, you're hurting me, Shelly moaned. What have you done? Why did you do this? Why did you bring that tramp if you knew it was forbidden? You've completely lost your mind, Shelly. Shelly looked fearfully at her husband. She had never seen him so furious. Why was he so angry with her? Why was he talking to her as if she had committed a crime? Mario, what are you doing? I did what I thought was right. My conscience is clear. Anyway, it's just a job. I can find another one. Is that such a problem? Where? Mario squeezed her hand even harder and moved closer to her face, where else will you find a job like that? Where else are you going to find a job as a nurse that pays this much? Don't be ridiculous. God, what a fool you are. You can't be trusted with anything. Some bum took advantage of your kindness. And you weren't smart enough to think about your family. You only thought of him. About yourself. What about me? What about Gail? Why didn't you think about us? It was work we needed. We were saving money, and now it's all going to stop. You see what your kindness has done to us. We just can't live normally anymore. You're so stupid. I'm speechless. How come I didn't realize it right away when I married you? Shelley stood there in shock. Hearing all those hurtful words, she even stopped feeling the pain of him squeezing her shoulder tightly. As soon as he spoke out, he abruptly let her go. He ruffled his hair and cried out, then stepped back to the sink. Shelley rubbed her shoulder and asked confusedly. Do you really think I'm stupid? Mario laughed evilly. I've told you so many things, and all you care about is whether I think you're stupid or not. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable, he paced back and forth for a few minutes. And then he stared at his wife with contempt and walked out of the kitchen. Shelley remained standing there, rubbing her sore shoulder. Ten minutes later Mario looked into the kitchen again. He was fully dressed. I'm leaving, he said briefly. Where are you going, Shelley asked fearfully. It's none of your business. Will you be back soon? I don't know. When I come back, I'll come back, and he left. Shelley sat down in a chair and sat until Gail woke up. Of course, in front of the baby you had to pretend everything was normal. And Shelley tried her best. She smiled at her daughter, said something to her. She got her hair done, and then she took her to daycare, and then she came home and waited for her husband. But Mario wouldn't come back. And when it was three o'clock in the afternoon, she still hadn't heard from him. Shelley panicked, so she started to call him. She called repeatedly, but he did not pick up, and then his phone was unavailable. Then Shelley realized that she had to pick up her child at daycare. She went to get her daughter, brought her home, fed her after daycare, then went to watch cartoons, and started calling her husband again. Finally, she got him on the phone. 
He picked up the phone. Mario, where did you go? Will you be back soon? I'm sorry if I hurt you. Come back, we'll talk. We'll talk it over, we'll apologize to each other, and everything will be fine. I promise that I will find a job as good as this one. And we'll be fine. Stop talking. You're too talkative. No, I'm not coming home now. I'll be gone for a few days. I'm away on business. Don't wait for me and don't look for me. And for God's sake, don't call the police. I'm not missing, I left of my own accord. That's it. Don't call me. I'm busy, and he hung up. Shelly sat there in shock. This was something she hadn't expected. Never before had Mario behaved this way. He had just dumped her, and she had to just wait for him to deign to come back. What if he's gone a week? What if he's gone for a month? What kind of a gig is that? But Shelly had nothing to do but wait for Mario to come back. And when he came back, wherever he was, she would talk to him seriously. And she would tell him that she would no longer tolerate such an attitude. Gail had questions about why Daddy still hadn't come home. Shelly had to lie that Daddy had gone on a business trip for a while. Gail almost threw a tantrum overnight. She demanded that Shelly call Mario so that he could talk to Gail and say goodnight to her. But, of course, Mario never picked up the phone again. Shelly cursed and tried her best to distract her daughter from her father. She succeeded, and Gail finally fell asleep. Shelly, on the other hand, couldn't sleep. She tried to understand how her life had changed so much in an instant. Only last night, she had left the house in a wonderful mood. 24 hours had passed, and everything had gone wrong for her. And she had no idea what to do next. Mario had been gone for four days. Shelly was all worked up. She couldn't even eat properly, only drank liters of coffee, which gave him tachycardia. The girl also started smoking while her daughter was in kindergarten. Shelly called her husband several times a day, even though he told her not to. But he didn't answer. Then four days later, he came home in great spirits. He looked great, unlike Shelly. Shelly, frowning and folding her arms across her chest, looked at him. Are you out of your mind, Mario? How can you disappear so suddenly without explaining anything? And where have you been all this time, said Shelly indignantly. But Mario had no remorse on his face. He calmly poured himself a coffee, diluted it with milk, and sat down at the table. I don't have to report to you. You didn't have to answer to me for your actions when you decided to make friends with the tramp. I don't have to answer to you either. Shelly almost choked with indignation. How dare you? Mario, what is the matter with you? And I only lost my job. A lot of people lose their jobs. But it's not the end of the world. I'll find a new one. Maybe not as good right away, but I'll find one anyway. And you put on a circus, a show. I don't recognize you. What happened to you? Mario stared at her intently for a long time. Then he sighed and answered, I was in another city at my sister's. Do you understand? She's been asking me to visit for a long time. We hadn't been in touch for a long time, and she wanted to get in touch with me. And now I got the chance. I took her up on her offer. At your sister's? I thought you said you didn't have anyone, that you were alone. You lied to me, said Shelly in shock. Mario shrugged. I just wasn't telling you enough. She and I haven't spoken in years. She's much older than me, and she left her parents' house a long time ago. Nobody knew where she was. And when my grandmother died, I inherited everything, this apartment and the house in the village. And now she's an heiress, too. Shelly could not believe her ears. The surprises continued. What else could happen? What else could happen that would shock her? So, I'm back from my sister, and I have two pieces of news. Shelly froze. She got a bad feeling. I'm filing for divorce. 
This was something Shelley had not expected. It was a shock. She stared at her husband without even blinking. She tried to believe she was imagining it, that he hadn't said those words to her. Then she decided it might have been a joke. He just wanted to teach her a lesson for doing something stupid, in his opinion. And she expected him to laugh now and shout that it was a joke. She was even ready to laugh with him, just so long as it was really a joke. But Mario was looking at her seriously. And Shelley realized that this was no joke at all. But why had it happened so suddenly? Everything was fine between them. They were fine, they had a wonderful family. And Shelley couldn't understand why he was saying that to her now. Are you serious? She asked Shelley in a trembling voice. Mario smirked. Yes, more than serious. And believe me, it's not a sudden decision. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I just wanted Gail to grow up a little. She's grown up now. It's not so hard with her anymore. And I'm filing for divorce because I don't love you anymore." Shelley felt herself begin to tremble all over. She was in real shock. What's the second news? And the second news, of course, is far more unpleasant than the divorce news. It's that my sister is demanding that we divide the inheritance. And I agree with her. If we are both heirs, we have to do it the right way. Paula suggested that I sell the apartment and the money just split in half. She doesn't want the house in the village, it stays with me, he was silent, and Shelley felt the ground slipping out from under her feet. What do you mean, selling the apartment? Mario, it's impossible. We put so much money into this place. Mario, I gave all my money from the sale of the apartment in one repair. I have nothing now. Mario, you can't do that. You can't sell the apartment. Look, I can do anything. It's my rightful place. So what if you gave all the money to fix it up? No one forced you to do it. You did it of your own free will. But you didn't mind, Mario threw up his hands, okay, this is all empty talk. It's already been decided. The apartment will soon be for sale. There's nothing you can do about it. And we, asked Shelley quietly. What about you? You will go to the country, you will live in that house my grandmother left me. You and Gail will be there, and I'll stay in town. I'll handle the sale of the apartment and the divorce. Shelley retreated a step and backed up against the wall. Mario, what are you talking about? How can we go to the country? What are we going to do there alone? And the kindergarten? What about work? How could you think of such a thing? Mario smirked sneeringly. What difference does it make to work? You don't have a job now. Like you said, you're a free bird now. That's right. So go to the country, since you're a free bird. Gail can go to daycare without going to daycare. You can do whatever you want, but I have an apartment to sell. Paula is very serious. I understand the need to get it all out of the way quickly. So you'll have to leave." Shelley shook her head firmly. I'm not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. I put my money in here, and you want to sell everything. That's not fair. You don't decide anything here. I already told you that. And you're going to move because you don't have a choice. You're sending your daughter out on the street, asked Shelley doubtfully. Why the street? Not to the street, but to the village. It would be better for her there. There is fresh air and more oxygen. She can walk there all the time. And there's a river there. Everything will be fine. She'll like it. I'm sure, he said and went out. And Shelley was left alone to digest everything her husband had told her. Her life is ruined. In some strange way, everything had collapsed in an instant, like a house of cards. She was confused, as if she had been abandoned in the middle of a desert island, but she hadn't yet fully realized what lay ahead of her. After a while the divorce between them came through. And when it did, when they were issued an official document, Shelley knew it was over. 
If she had had any hope that things would still get better, she now realized that this was the end. After the trial, Mario calmly told her to pack her things. And then he would take them to the village. Shelly first decided to talk to her daughter. She called the kindergarten teacher before that and told her that they were leaving, so Gail would not be going to kindergarten. Then she called the supervisor. Shelly asked her what she should do. The superintendent advised her not to pick up the paperwork for a month. Maybe they would come back and Gail would go back to her group. But if they were gone for more than a month, she would have to pick up the paperwork. Then Shelly sat her daughter in front of her and said, Gail. You're so grown up now. I want to talk to you like a big girl. You see, Gail, we'll have to go away. Where to, the girl asked naively. We'll go to the country. We have to live there for a while. Why, Gail asked quietly. Well it's better there, and the air is cleaner, and there is a river, and all sorts of animals. You will like it there. You'll see. There's lots of kids there. You'll make friends with someone. But I already have friends in kindergarten. Why would I need more? It would be too much. Shelley blushed. The daughter doesn't understand that she won't be able to go to kindergarten. You see, honey, how can I put it, you won't be socializing with those friends yet. You're not going to go to that kindergarten yet. That's just the way it is. We'll live too far away, and we won't be able to go to town to go to kindergarten. Gail sat looking at her mother for a long time, and then her eyes began to fill with tears. I don't want to go to the country. I don't want to go away. And I don't want to go anywhere with you. I want to stay with daddy. Don't take me to the country. Let me stay with daddy. Daddy, where are you? I want to be with you. Don't let mama take me away. She wants to take me far, far away. I don't want to, daddy. But Mario wasn't home. He had gone away somewhere. And he didn't give a damn about his daughter. How could Shelley explain to Gail that it had originally been her father's idea? He's the one taking them there, not Shelley. He's not helping Gail in any way. They have to leave because Shelley and Mario are divorced. The daughter cried and ran around the apartment for a while, looking for her father. Then she settled down and fell asleep. And Shelley knew that the baby didn't understand anything. She was so happy and at ease, and now all these changes would put their usual way of life upside down. And to get used to everything and come to terms with it, they would have to try very hard. When Mario showed up two days later, Shelley was already packed. Gail threw herself around her father's neck when her father saw him. Don't let mommy take me away. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to be here with you. Why are you letting mom do this? Why are you giving me away? I don't want to go to the country. Daddy, I want to live here and go to my favorite kindergarten. Daddy, don't leave me. Mario listened to his daughter, looking at Shelly from behind. And as soon as the words ran out, he tore his daughter's hands from around her neck and said sternly, looking her in the eye and waving his index finger in front of her nose. Stop this hysteria. Don't you know how to behave? What kind of manners are these? Are you going to make me angry yet? Shame on you, Gail, shame on you. Very ashamed. I don't even know what to say. I've always been proud of my daughter, and now this. It doesn't work like that. Why are you hiding? You have to face adversity with your head held high. That's what you should do. You must go to the village, that's all. There's nothing more to discuss. And don't get on my nerves anymore, my daughter, I have things to do. I don't have time to persuade you. Tomorrow morning I will come and get you and your things and take you to the village. Gail looked at her father with tears in her eyes. She was frightened. She had counted on him to protect her, to help her, but he had only frightened her more. That night Gail slept with her mother. She was huddled against her, silent, miserable. And Shelley's heart was bursting with pain. How she wished she could help her little daughter. 
how she would have liked to protect her from all trouble and hardship. What could she do at the moment? Only hold her, pray that they would endure with dignity and without consequence this ordeal that had so suddenly fallen on their heads. Are you asleep, whispered Gail. No, my sunshine. I am awake. And why aren't you asleep, my dear? I'm right beside you. You have nothing to be afraid of. I'm not afraid. Mom, I just can't sleep. Something is bothering me. Shelly smiled. Sometimes her daughter is so serious, like she's at least 10 years old. Mom, is the country really nice, asked Gail doubtfully. Shelly sighed and bit her lip. It was time to protect her daughter from everything that was happening to them. She had to convince her that they would be fine there. At least let Gail go there in good spirits. Maybe that mood will stay with her when she arrives. Yes, people live well there, they rarely get sick. And there you can eat organic food. And there are a lot of animals, which give milk and meat. There you can grow your own vegetables and fruits and plant flowers. And you can build a sandbox there. And there are many other children there who walk outside. You can make friends with them. You will have your own company. And the house is nice and big. There will be plenty of room for us there. You and I can run and dance, walk on the grass barefoot. You'll help me cook. I'll teach you how to make pancakes, and we'll go with you to the river and swim and sunbathe," Shelley told her daughter. Gail listened with bated breath. Shelley looked at her daughter. There was a slight smile on Gail's lips. Yes. Shelley had succeeded in calming her daughter. Thank God. That was the most important thing. The next morning Mario arrived. Shelley greeted him with indifference. She had long since stopped caring where he slept. At first she had asked him these questions several times, but he answered sharply and rudely that it was none of her business at all. Shelley could not believe that in just one day he had gone from loving spouse to hated stranger. Is there such a thing? But now Shelley knew it could. Mario took their things and loaded them into the car. I gave an assignment to a firm. They went to the house this weekend, cleaned it all up, bought all the furniture and appliances they needed. Everything will be there. You won't have to worry, Mario said indifferently, not looking at Shelley. She did not answer. Gail was silent all the way and stared out the window. She cradled her favorite teddy bear that Shelley had given her. Shelley could tell by her tightly clenched fingers that her daughter was nervous. Mario, on the other hand, was calm the whole way. He was in good spirits. Sometimes he smiled and hummed a tune. When they arrived, Mario quickly unloaded their things and carried them into the house. And Shelley and Gail stood outside, looking around the house. They held hands tightly. Mario came out of the house, slammed the door, and walked over to them. He held out his keys to Shelley. Well, have a nice day, he said, and without waiting for an answer from both of them, he went to his car. After a couple of minutes he drove off. Shelley and Gail continued to stare at the house. Then Shelley sighed and looked at her daughter. Gail had a look of interest. She saw something in the yard. Shelley followed her gaze. There was a chicken running around. The chicken must have gotten in here from the neighbors. It was unlikely that chickens lived in this house by themselves. Somebody had to keep an eye on them. Maybe we'll get chickens, too, Shelley said uncertainly, to break the lingering silence. Gail glowed. Really? Can we? Mommy, that would be great. Shelley realized that she had caught her daughter's interest. That's great. Let there be more positive emotions than negative ones. Yes, we all can now. We are our own mistresses. We can have a cow if we want to. I just don't know how to milk a cow, Shelley said. That's all right. We'll learn, answered Gail cheerfully, and pulled her mother toward the house. Shelley, not looking under her feet, obediently followed her daughter. Then she felt her foot step into something soft. It was a dung heap. Quite fresh. 
Shelly squeaked squeamishly. Oh, said Gail, staring at the pile of dung with her eyes wide open. No, we probably won't have a cow just yet, Shelly pronounced her verdict. Gail nodded. After wiping her sneaker on the grass, Shelly followed Gail into the yard. The yard was pretty decent. The inside of the house was fine too, clean and tidy. And Mario had really taken care of everything, everything they needed was there. All the appliances were the cheapest, but everything worked. There was even some food in the fridge, and on the table there was a bag of cereal, pasta, canned goods and household chemicals. Mario made sure that at least for a few days Shelly would get used to the new place. And then she would have to take care of everything herself. Shelly had money left over from the last two months of work. She never gave it to her husband to put in a bank account. She has enough money to live on for two or three months. And then what would happen? Shelly hadn't thought about it yet. She asked Mario to give her half of the money she collected from her salary. But Mario didn't give her anything. He said that the money would be Gail's, and that when she grew up he would give it to her. But Shelly suspected that neither she nor her daughter would ever see that money. Something told her she was wrong to trust her husband so much. During the rest of the day Shelly and Gail were busy unpacking. Gail had a wonderful room. She liked it very much. The girl was in a good mood. She had a view of the garden from her window. And she liked it so much she wanted to go to bed quickly so she could immerse herself in her thoughts and dreams. Shelly put her daughter to bed and began to make notes in her notebook, what they needed to buy, what they needed to do, where they needed to go. Then she wanted to go to bed, but sleep wouldn't come, so she decided to make pancakes for tomorrow. The recipe took her two hours to make. In that time she had time to change her mind about a lot of things. She tried to make plans, but it was too early. She still couldn't concentrate. The events of the past few months had changed her life dramatically. One thing Shelley knew for sure was that summer was coming. It was the beginning of May, and it was necessary to decide what to do during the summer, because then autumn and winter would come. And without money to be in the winter in the country, it is not desirable to the enemy. Only when there was no pancake dough left, Shelley calmed down. And as soon as her head touched the pillow, she instantly fell asleep. The next morning Shelly woke up early. She was awakened by the roosters. When she heard these sharp noises almost under the window, she jumped up in bed. What is it? Who? Why? Why? What was going on? Shelly realized it was the roosters. She groaned and leaned back on her pillow, but she couldn't sleep again. She changed her clothes, made the bed, and went out into the kitchen. Gail was already sitting at the table eating a pancake. Wow, you're up so early. Why didn't you wake me up? Gail's daughter shrugged her shoulders. She continued to eat, dangling her feet under the table. Shelly noted with satisfaction that her daughter was in a good mood. I'll make you some tea now. Shelly washed her face, then made Gail wash her face. They both brushed their teeth and then sat down for tea and pancakes. After everything Shelly cleared the table and washed the dishes, and then they went out into the yard. Shelly sat down on the steps and Gail started wandering around the yard. Shelly watched her, thinking about something of her own. Then a woman a little older than Shelly came up to the fence. She looked intently at Gail, then at Shelly. Gail walked up to the woman and said hello. The woman immediately smiled and replied. You are so well-mannered and polite. You can tell right away that you had a decent upbringing. Shelly smiled slightly. The woman waved at her. Hey, hello. You live here now, don't you? Or are you just visiting? Shelly didn't really want to talk to strangers, but she couldn't show such stupidity by not responding when she was approached. Shelly stood up and walked closer to the fence. Yes, we live here now. This is my ex-husband's house, but after the divorce it was decided that I and my daughter would live here now. It's more comfortable for us, when she said all that, she immediately regretted it. And why was she telling everything to a woman she didn't know? Who had forced her? 
she should have kept quiet. The woman nodded her head understandingly. I understand. Well, then you are my neighbors. I live to your right. I'm also without a husband. He died in the fields. An accident. My daughter and I live on our own. My daughter will be seven years old. Maybe she and yours will become friends. What's your name and your daughter's name? My name is Shelly, and my daughter's name is Gail. The woman smiled and held out her hand to Shelly. And my name is Rebecca. And my daughter's name is Peggy. By the way, have you seen my chicken? She ran away. I couldn't find her the day before. She was hiding. Clever chicken. When they say they don't have enough brains like a chicken, they just haven't seen them run away. Maybe. I saw her running yesterday and this morning, and then she disappeared somewhere, Shelly replied. Rebecca slapped herself on her wide thighs. The horror. When I get a hold of her, I'm going to scold her. Oh, said Gail frightenedly. Rebecca looked at the girl and hastened to reassure her. My dear, don't be frightened. It's just a joke. It's just a chicken. And you, I see, brought up, but very scared. It's all right. You'll live in the country for a while, and you won't be afraid anymore. Gail snuggled up to Shelley. All right, I'll go. I have a lot to do. But I'll come by tonight and bring you meat pie and jam tarts. We'll have tea and get to know each other better. And I'll bring my daughter with me. Let the girls become friends, too, Rebecca nodded and went about her business, while Shelley stood there in bewilderment. She didn't even say anything back to her neighbor. But that didn't even embarrass her. Since she said she was coming, she would. What if Shelley didn't want her to come? What if she doesn't want to communicate with anyone? She just wants to be left alone. But it seems to be customary here to pry into the soul uninvited. However, in the evening Shelley realized that she was not the least bit sorry that her neighbor had come to visit her with her daughter. First of all, Gail and Peggy immediately found common ground, and they became instant friends. Shelley saw her daughter's eyes light up. Apparently, she didn't even have a friend like that in kindergarten. Secondly, Rebecca was very fun and easy to talk to. They got to talking, and before she knew it Shelley had told her roommate how she had ended up here. What a fool your husband is. I'm sorry. How can you do this to your wife? And just because you got fired? What a pig, Rebecca said indignantly. Shelley shrugged her shoulders. I think he hasn't loved me for a long time and wanted to break up. There just wasn't a reason. Or maybe he was fine with it. Maybe he had some kind of agenda. That's for sure. But when I lost my job, I guess his patience snapped. Or he thought I'd stay at home. But I told him I was going to look for a job right away. Rebecca shook her head doubtfully. Eh. It was wrong of you to sell your apartment. I don't know much about that sort of thing, but you were left with nothing, that's for sure. And if you had, you would have a place of your own. You wouldn't have had to worry. Shelley tensed a little. So this is the place. This is the house we moved into on purpose. We'll be here, and he'll sell the apartment, split it with his sister, and then he'll buy himself something. Rebecca squinted, looking at Shelley. Yes, you will be here. Whose house is this on the deed? Is it yours? Whose? Shelley opened her mouth and froze. Then she said quietly, No, it's not mine. The papers say the house belongs to my ex-husband. Did you share anything in the divorce? Did you sign any documents on the division of property? Did you give the child a share of the house? Rebecca persisted. Shelley just blinked. She went pale. No, nothing like that happened, she whispered. Rebecca tapped her palm on the table. Eh, feels my soul that that's not all the bad things your ex-husband did. Shelley was silent for a long time, and then she muttered, And you say you don't know anything about these things. Rebecca sighed. I have a friend who lives in town. 
She recently went through a scandalous divorce with her husband. And there was a full-fledged division of all assets. So I know all about it. She told me everything. I wish I'd had a friend like you when I was going through a divorce, Shelley sighed. Rebecca looked at her sympathetically. That's all right, my good man. Everything will be all right. We won't let you get hurt. You're our country girl now. I'll introduce you to everyone, and you'll make friends with everyone, you'll get a job. Everything will be all right. You won't be alone anymore. When Shelley saw her neighbor off with her daughter, she put Gail to bed, who could barely stand up from exhaustion. Then Shelley cleaned the kitchen and went to bed. For the first time in a long time, she allowed herself to cry. She cried profusely for about half an hour, crying out all that was on her mind. And then she felt better. She fell asleep with the idea that everything was going to be okay. Over the next few weeks, Rebecca introduced Shelley to everyone. She showed her the local stores where she could buy groceries. She told her where she could buy the best vegetables. She showed her who you could buy the best meat and dairy products from, and you could buy fruit from another neighbor for a very good price. Shelley's head was spinning from so much information, and she even wrote everything down in her notebook. That way she would not forget anything important. Everyone liked Shelley. Everyone took her kindly. Everyone said that she could ask for help at any time. Shelley had never felt so supported. For some reason she remembered Timothy. If he were here in the village now, she'd find him a place to live. Maybe put him up at her place. He would help her with her chores. She would have thought of him as her father, and Gail would have called him grandfather. But after that incident, Shelley never saw Timothy again. She went to the garbage cans many times, but she never saw him. There was no sign that he was alive. He had either gone somewhere else, or he was dead. Shelley tried not to think about the worst of it, but bad thoughts crept into her head. One day she and Rebecca were walking through the village, and Shelley said that she was getting very bad with money. And then Rebecca said to her, So what's the problem? Go to work. Who's keeping you at home? I'm not leaving Gail home alone, objected Shelley. Rebecca wondered. Why would you leave her home? Put her in daycare? Kindergarten? There's a kindergarten here, wondered Shelley, stopping. And then Rebecca laughed. She laughed for a very long time. She even got tears. Shelley thought her friend was going to be sick. But finally Rebecca calmed down a little. You almost killed me, Shelley. Yeah, imagine that. We have a daycare center. Can you imagine, we put our kids in kindergarten, too. And we also have a school. Can you imagine? Of course, that can't be, but it is. Shelley blushed. Why did she think so, that people here don't really do anything, don't teach their children? For some reason she felt ashamed. Yes, Shelley, we have a kindergarten, and a school, and a post office, and stores, and even a small pharmacy. What's the matter with you? I didn't think you'd feel that way about us. I'm sorry, I was stupid. I don't know what came over me, Shelley admitted. Okay, I'll take you to the daycare, you'll meet the manager. She's a very nice woman, very kind. You explain to her the whole situation and ask her to take her daughter into the group. And a couple of months ago a nurse was needed for the kindergarten. Ask her if she still needs one. It'll be great then. And you'll get a job, and your daughter will be assigned. The next day Shelley went with Gail to the daycare center. She liked the kindergarten very much. It was very cozy, beautiful, clean, and bright. The children were having fun chatting outside. Shelley went to the office of the manager. She told her daughter to stand still at the door, and she knocked and walked in. Hello, what's this about, said a pleasant-looking woman. Hello, I'd like to talk to you. Excuse me, my name is Shelley. I'd like to talk to you about my daughter and I was wondering if… Oh, it's you. You're the one Rebecca called me about. That's right. I understand you want to put your daughter in daycare. 
Shelly nodded in surprise. She nodded in surprise. Rebecca had time to intervene. Well, I can tell you that, unfortunately, we don't have a place. Shelly sighed disappointedly. What a pity. But then the supervisor smiled. But we do have a nursing position. You could get a job with us. And we have to take the children of our employees to kindergarten. If you work for us, there will be a place for your daughter, too. Shelly smiled. She found a job right away. And she said yes. When she walked out of the superintendent's office, she was smiling. Of course, it wasn't exactly what she had dreamed of. She knew very well that a kindergarten nurse couldn't get much. But she didn't need much now. She needed a job to make enough money to live on. And most importantly, her daughter would be there for her. They would come and go together. I mean, that's just great. And it was all thanks to Rebecca. Shelley was happy that she had met such a friend. She was sure to return the favor, she too would be a faithful friend to her and would always come to her aid if needed. Soon Shelley received her daughter's paperwork from her last daycare, and she immediately processed her daughter, and she checked herself into a new job. Within two weeks they were both going to daycare. Everything was perfect. Gail really liked kindergarten. She found new friends right away. The children were just wonderful, very friendly, and fun. Gail also really liked her teacher, she was very kind and smiling, but moderately strict. The children loved her and she loved the children. She was a godsend educator. Shelley found common ground with everyone, especially she became friends with the junior kindergarten teacher. This older woman was so kind, and she was just like Shelley's grandmother. Everything went on as usual. Shelley worked, Gail went to kindergarten. On the weekends they went for walks either by themselves or with Rebecca. Rebecca began to make attempts to accommodate Shelley. She claimed that they had some decent guys in the village who were right for her. And Rebecca wanted Shelley to find her happiness. What are you talking about, Shelley? What suitors? I'm past the age of being able to build a relationship. I have a daughter. I'm divorced. Don't make this up. Why? Are you old or something? No. You're also very attractive. Don't you notice how guys look at you? With admiration, Shelley. Don't make this up. Just because you're divorced and have a child doesn't mean no one wants you anymore. On the contrary, you are now one of the most attractive brides. What can I say? You know how to give birth to children, beautiful, hardworking, efficient. All the virtues on display. Shelley irritatedly cut off. I do not care who is looking at me. And why? I do not care. I've been married before, and I don't want to go there anymore. I have a daughter. That's who I'm going to live with. But someday my daughter will grow up, and you'll be alone. Think about that. I don't want to think about it. Let's close the subject. Rebecca was silent, but she wouldn't give up the idea of hitting on Shelly. It was Saturday. Shelly had the day off. She left Gail with a neighbor to let the girl play with Peggy and went to the store herself. She needed to buy some groceries. As she was on her way home from the store, she saw an expensive car not far away. It was a black Jeep. It certainly wasn't someone from here. She walked slowly and watched as a man ran out of the car and started running back and forth, cursing. Shelley frowned as she watched him. What was it with him? Why was he so angry? Was something wrong? Wouldn't it be easier for her to go the other way so she wouldn't have to face him? But then Shelley decided she had nothing to fear. She's in her own village. Nothing will happen to her. She stepped closer. And then she noticed that the man kept looking at his hand and waving it. Something was definitely wrong with him. As soon as the man noticed her, he ran up to her. Dash, young lady, honey, can you help me? I can't take it anymore. What's the matter with you? Shelley asked in surprise. The palm. Look at my palm. 
Someone bit me, I don't know what it is. I grabbed the steering wheel, and it burned me like fire. I couldn't even see straight. I didn't see anything. I didn't know what it was, but now my palm was swollen. So it couldn't have been some kind of poisonous snake, and that's why my arm hurts so bad. Shelly frowned. A snake, she didn't know what a snake bite looked like, but there must be two holes. She set the bags on the ground and took his palm in her hands, examining the bite site carefully, she smiled. If you're smiling, that means it's not so bad, right, said the man, who had been watching her face carefully the whole time. Shelly nodded. You've been stung by a bee. A bee? Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. The sting is sticking out. It has to come out, replied Shelly. Why does it hurt so much if it's just a bee, the man wondered. You've never been stung by a bee, wondered Shelly in turn. The man shook his head, looking at his hand in amazement. Shelly sighed. She rummaged in her bag and pulled out an onion. You have to take the sting out, and then put half of the onion to the bite. And then the pain will gradually subside. The man gave her his hand. She seemed to pull the sting out herself. Then the man brought her a knife from the car. Shelly cut an onion and put one half to his palm. Oh my god, what a relief, the man said quietly. But I only put it on. It can't stop hurting in a second. The man looked at her carefully and blushed. I thought I was bitten by a snake. That's why I am relieved now, the man admitted. They were silent for a couple of minutes. Shelley held the bulb in his palm. The man scrutinized her, and then he said, My name is Victor. Shelley was embarrassed, but replied, And I am Shelley. Nice to meet you. Shelley, you've been very helpful. I would probably go on scaring everybody with my panic. I am very ashamed. I don't know what came over me. I don't usually act like this. Shelley smiled. Well, what are you? Why are you apologizing? It can happen to anyone. The pain subsided. Victor looked at her in silence. Yes, the pain had subsided, but he didn't want to talk about it. He wanted to talk to her some more. She was so charming. This country girl had such a genuine smile, just adorable. Her eyes looked at him with such care and concern. He glimpsed her right hand. There was no wedding ring. So she wasn't married. Yes, the pain has subsided a little, but not completely. That's good. I think I'll be going now. I have to go. Victor tried to think of some other excuse to delay her. While he was thinking, she lifted her bags from the ground and took a few steps. Wait, Shelly. Shelly stopped and turned around. Can you still help me, he asked, I need to find one address. Or rather, I need to find one house at this address. Maybe you can help me? All right. Tell me the address. If I know it, I'll tell you where to go. And Victor told her the address he wanted. As soon as Shelley heard it, she went pale and crepuscular. This was her address. This was her home. She stared at Victor for a while, then slowly said, Are you sure this is the address you want? You're not mistaken? Victor shook his head. No, I'm sure. My client clearly wrote this address to me. Client, Shelley wondered. Yes, a client. I'm a realtor, I sell houses and apartments. And then Shelley realized that something terrible was coming. She had to figure out what it was. Yes, I know that address. And you're in luck. I live right next door to it. I can come with you, I can show you the house. Victor glowed. Now there was a way to have a long chat with her. And he would drive very slowly so he could talk to her longer. Sure. Get in the car. Give me your bags. I'll put them back. Shelly gave him her bags and sat in the front seat next to the driver. Victor soon got in and started the car. Shelly showed him where to go. 
Victor tried to find out if she was married and if she had a fiancé, but she didn't answer definitively. Then he found out her age and was delighted. She was four years younger than him. Then Victor berated himself. Why was he so interested in this country girl? Wasn't he enough of a townie? He is a grown man. He had been burned several times in a relationship so that after such a negative experience he had promised himself never to get married. And then there's Shelley. She had him charmed in a matter of minutes. And there was nothing he could do about it. When they arrived, Shelley showed him the right house. Victor turned off the car and looked at it intently with his tenacious gaze. Shelley watched the realtor. It was time to find out exactly why he had come and who his client was. Why do you want this house? she asked. I have to make an outside inspection and appraise this house, Victor replied absent-mindedly, tapping his fingers on the steering wheel. And why would you want to do that? It's my client's wish. He wants to sell this house. And he wants to know what price he can get for it. I understand someone lives there. The client doesn't want to bother the tenants yet. I just need to visually assess the condition of the house. Shelley realized it was bad. It couldn't get any worse. Is your client's name Mario? She asked quietly. He stared at the house for a few minutes, and then he understood. He changed his face and slowly turned to her. How do you know? Victor said in a faltering tone. Shelley sighed and closed her eyes. Such betrayal made it hurt even more. He still won't leave her and her daughter alone. He wants to take everything away from them, just like Rebecca said. Yes, she wasn't wrong. Shelley has yet to experience trouble from her ex-husband. That's my ex-husband. And it's not tenants who live in this house, it's me and my daughter Gail. That's my and Mario's daughter. Victor was shocked. There was no way he was expecting this. His client had made it clear to him that he had inherited this house from his grandmother, and that he had to sell it because he had to give some of the money to his own sister. And he persuasively insisted that Victor not disturb the people who lived in the house. Mario didn't know when he would put the house on the market. And he didn't want to alarm the people who rented the house from him. It turns out that his ex-wife and his own daughter lived in this house. He wants to sell the house and kick them out. Is that it? I don't understand it. It just doesn't make any sense. Is it his house or yours? No, this is his house. It's just that he and I broke up. He asked me to move out of the apartment into this house. And I said yes. I had no choice. I had nothing and I had nowhere to go. And now it turns out that he wants to kick me out of here. Trouble. Victor shook his head incredulously. I didn't expect this in any way. This has never happened in all my practice. Tell me, how did it all happen? Shelley looked at him carefully. There was genuine surprise and sympathy written all over his face. He really didn't know anything about anything. My daughter is at a neighbor's right now. I'll take her and invite you to my place. I'll make you a cup of tea and tell you everything." Victor nodded. He watched as Shelley made her way to her neighbor's house. A couple of minutes later she came out with a pretty girl who was running along at a gallop. She seemed to be humming something out loud. Then Victor saw Shelley wave to him. She called out to him. Victor sighed, slightly nervous. What a job he'd gotten. He got out of the car, headed toward Shelley. Her daughter watched him carefully. Mommy, who's that? Shelley smiled and answered, Oh, it's an old acquaintance of mine. We haven't seen each other in a long time. He and I need to talk. And you can watch cartoons while we talk. Gail nodded with a smile. Hi, I'm Victor, Victor held out his hand to the girl. She shook it cheerfully and replied, Hi, and my name is Gail. They all went inside the house. Gail washed her hands and went to watch cartoons, and Shelley made tea, got some meat pies out of the fridge, heated them up, and then got some jam and pancakes. 
Ten minutes later, they were sitting at the table eating. When Victor had eaten, he said with a sigh, I don't understand what's happening to me today. I was just going to talk to you, Shelley. But when I saw all the goodies on the table, it was like a veil appeared before my eyes. It was like I couldn't see anything but all this delicious stuff. It was only now that I realized that I was being horrible. You must think I'm crazy or some kind of maniac. I'm very ashamed of how I'm acting myself, he shook his head and covered his eyes with his hand. Shelley laughed softly. Why, really? What's the big deal? I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad my treat has such an effect on you. Victor took his hand away from her face and looked at her carefully. Shelley was confused. What happened to you? And explain to me, what's going on? Why didn't Mario tell me his ex-wife and his own daughter lived here? Are you in a fight with him, or did something happen between you? Shelley shook her head, then answered, I don't even know what to tell you. I didn't understand it myself. We broke up so suddenly. I did not suspect anything. I lost my job and he got mad. And everything went wrong from then on. He said he was filing for divorce and then he said our apartment had to be sold because he needed to share his sister. I don't even know if he really has a sister anymore. I'm starting to have my doubts here, too. Yes, he does have a sister. Except that's not what they told me. They said they were selling the apartment because his sister gave up all rights to it. But the house had to be sold and the sister had to split the money. Somehow it was said that way. You're telling me now, and I don't know what's true and what's false anymore, Victor answered. Shelley stared at Victor, and then she told him everything from the beginning. She told him how she and Mario had met, how they had gotten married, how they had had a daughter and how Mario had forced her to change jobs, how she had befriended a homeless man, how she had helped him and then taken him to her place of work for the night. And she told how a colleague had betrayed her, told her boss about everything that had happened. She was kicked out, and then all her problems with her husband started. It was as if he was only with her because she worked in that nursing home. She also told me that he had never been seen to be scheming or cheating. She always trusted him. And what had happened to him in such a short period of time, she did not understand. Victor listened carefully to her by the end of her story he was simply amazed. How much she had had to put up with. Yes, you really were wrong to sell your own apartment. No matter how much you trusted your partner, your friend, your brother, your husband, we shouldn't deprive ourselves of our own personal time, space, possessions. It was personally yours. And now you, I take it, have nothing. And there's no way to change that. No court, even if you sue, will take your side. You sold the apartment of your own free will. You gave the money for the repairs yourself. You can't make any claims now. You are already divorced. Before the divorce, during the process itself, you could still agree on something, demand something, but now it's too late. Unfortunately, if he wants to sell this house, which is his property, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Shelley shook her head and sighed. A nightmare. This is a nightmare. What am I going to tell my daughter? How am I going to tell her her own father wants to kick us out? She's just getting used to her new life, we're doing well, we've made new friends. We are happy here and we don't want to leave. And now. And now all hell will break loose again. And what will Gail do when she finds out? God, I won't survive this, she read quietly. Victor looked at her, and he felt so sorry for her, as if he had known her for a hundred years. And now he must help her in any way he could. Only how to do it right. I mean, he took the job. He took money from a client, however small, but he took it. But he can't leave Shelley and her daughter in trouble. That would be a terrible thing to do. She has been so good to him. He can't do that to her now. Shelley suddenly calmed down. Why was she showing weakness to a stranger? And anyway, what had gotten into her? She invited a man into the house who worked for her ex-husband. And if he tells Mario everything? What if Mario gets angry and comes himself to kick them out right away? What to do then? 
Shelly looked at Victor, and he kept his eyes on her. And then Shelly felt a warmth form inside her. She felt herself blushing. This Victor embarrassed her. And she couldn't understand why he was having this effect on her. But after a couple of minutes she calmed down and acknowledged that she liked him. Yes, she has a liking for him, even though she only met him a few hours ago, but she's already sitting with him and talking to him like she's really known him for years. Why is this suddenly happening all of a sudden? And then Victor put his hand on her palm. Shelly, I'll help you. What? Will you help me? Shelly asked, confused. Victor nodded. Yes, I will help you. I can't just leave it at that. I think your husband is pulling some kind of a scam. I can't be a part of it. I need to find out if he really has a sibling and what's going on with the division of his inheritance." Shelley gently released her hand from his arm and murmured, "'His sister. He said he was visiting her and that he hadn't seen her in years. And now she insists that he sell his grandmother's apartment and split the money in half. And about the house, he told me I could live here with my daughter. I thought he didn't give it away. I didn't even think he lied to me, that he lied to his daughter. That's so low, it's so mean of him. How could I have been married to that man? I didn't know him at all. What else could I know about him? What other surprises await me? Victor hastened to reassure her. He moved closer and said, I'll leave you my card. And you give me your number. We'll be in touch. Believe me, I won't let him throw you out. I won't let that happen. I won't let him hurt innocent people. I need time to figure this out. You believe me, don't you? Shelley gazed spellbound into his eyes. What an extraordinary man. He offers his help just like that. And why does she believe him? Why does she feel that he will really help her? Is it a gut feeling, an intuition, or something else? She nodded and answered, yes, I believe. He nodded contentedly and then prepared to leave. They exchanged phone numbers one last time. He promised her that he would call her as soon as he heard something. When he left, Shelley sat at the table for a long time, trying to comprehend everything. Fate had brought her together with a man who, unsuspectingly, had been sent by her ex-husband. And now this man was taking her side. Why had this happened? But what worried her most was the effect he was having on her. It was as if she was becoming a completely different person. Then Shelley cleared the table and decided to go see Rebecca. She trusted her neighbor, and even though she hated to admit that the neighbor had been right about her ex-husband, it was still worth telling her. She and Gail went to the neighbor's house again. The girls went to play in Peggy's room, and Shelley told her friend all about meeting the young and attractive realtor, her husband's machinations, and everything else. Rebecca listened to Shelley carefully. It must be said that the friend behaved delicately. She didn't tell Shelley that she was right about her husband, that Shelley was stupid for trusting Mario, and the like. She just sighed and shook her head. Shelley. I feel sorry for you. You should have met such an asshole in your life. Well, let's hope this young realtor really helps you out. Although, interestingly enough, I have a few questions. Are you sure you haven't met him before? Maybe you've seen him once and you just don't remember? No, Rebecca, what are you talking about? How can you forget a man if you've met him? Besides, I certainly wouldn't forget him. Rebecca stared at her friend. And Shelley realized that she had said too much, and she blushed slightly. To hide her embarrassment, she scooted home. Victor got home and thought for a long time about what he should do next. He had to call Mario and tell him if he had been to the village, if he had seen the house. He should have told him the price of the house. Victor decided to put off calling the client until tomorrow, but Mario called him himself. Naturally, Victor couldn't help but answer. Hello, hello, I just wanted to call you, Victor said when he answered the phone. I've waited too long for your call. What's up? Have you been to the village? Have you seen the house? Victor tried to find the right answer. 
He was about to say that he couldn't find the village, or he couldn't find the house, or the car was stuck somewhere, or broke down, or had a flat tire. But immediately he realized that all these excuses sounded like rotten excuses. And it didn't look right. If Victor behaved this way with him, Mario might refuse his services, find another realtor, hire him, and no longer show sympathy for Shelley and her daughter. And that would be the end of it. No one will help them, no one will take care of them. Yes, I was in the village, and I saw the house, he said slowly. Mario made a disgruntled sound. Victor, why don't you call then? Why should I call you? It seems to me that I'm the one paying money for services and you're the one who should be calling me and trying to please me. Isn't that so? Victor pressed his lips together. How he would like to punch this Mario in the face right now. Yes, his face, not his face. What a scoundrel he was. Mario, of course. I told you I was going to call you. I just got there five minutes ago. All right, then. All right, then. I'm waiting for your verdict, Mario replied indifferently. Mario, you see, really this house is quite ordinary. It's not remarkable. The plot is small, or rather, not small, but narrow. If potential buyers want to build there, it will be quite a problem. Because of this the price of the house will be much lower. The renovation of the house is not very. I do not know what's inside the house, but it does not really matter. Outside it needs to be cleaned up. But this is if the potential buyer is going to live there. And I needed to know how many rooms in the house, as things stand with communications, with all the amenities. Just a visual inspection is not enough. If you want to know if you can get something for this house, yes. You can tell from the outside. But if you want a certain amount of money, at least an approximate amount, then you have to look at absolutely everything. And you're not giving me that opportunity. Maybe you could arrange with the tenants, and they wouldn't mind me looking around inside? No, that's out of the question. You can't. Can't? Okay, I'll see what I can do. I think I can still arrange to look inside the house. I just need to take care of a few things. I'll call you, and he hung up. Victor sat with the telephone in his hands for a while, and then a determined expression appeared on his face. He knew what he was going to do next, he dialed the phone and waited for an answer. Hello, Jim. Hi. Haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah, we should just get together sometime, but I'm calling about business right now. I need you to set up a stakeout for someone. Yes, I really need it, as a friendship, so to speak. I'll make it worth your while. You know that. Yeah, I'll get you all the info I know on him. If you need anything else, you let me know. They finished talking. Victor texted all the information to his friend. Yes, Victor decided to have Mario followed. Somehow Victor thought that Mario wasn't the only one involved in all this. And since his sister's name was all over the place, wasn't she the one stirring things up? Isn't she controlling Mario? Why did his older sister decide to leave everyone with empty pockets? Could it be that his sister was then also the one who fluffed Mario himself? It's better to deal with it. Maybe with surveillance. A week later, a friend called. Victor, hi. So, Jim, can you tell me anything? Yeah, we just need to meet. Then I've got a lot of evidence, pictures. And I don't like to talk about this kind of stuff over the phone. It's better to meet me face to face. Victor agreed to meet, and an hour later Jim was at his house. They settled down in the sala. Jim took out a folder of various documents and photographs. That Mario of yours is a very dodgy fellow. I thought he was a regular guy, leading a regular life, but then all sorts of things about him started popping up. First of all, he sells tablets at work. And it's illegal. He orders delivery from China, and they sell them as originals. That alone could get him locked up if he tried a little harder. And secondly, he has a mistress. And not just one. He has several women for love. 
but only one has a close relationship with him. She has a great influence on him. And with the other women he just meets from time to time. It's just that he's having a nice time with them. Victor frowned as he looked at the pictures. The lover's name is Cindy. She's a very interesting and bossy woman. You only have to see her once in person to see what she's like. She manipulates him all she wants. And I don't think there's any love there. It's all about gain. The woman probably doesn't love anyone either, Jim finished his story. Victor listened attentively and closed his file. He held out his hand to Valerie. Thank you, Jim. You've helped me out. You found out what I needed to know. I can take it from here. Are you sure you don't need my help anymore, replied Jim, shaking Victor's hand. Victor shook his head. Then Jim smiled and rubbed his palms together. Well, great. Then I can finally go on my vacation. I hope I'm not disturbing you, Victor asked hopefully. Jim stood up and waved his hand. I've been gone for a week. So what if my girlfriend has been resting there for a week by herself? But she missed me terribly. It's okay, Victor. You know I value our friendship very much. If you need help, I will always do everything in my power. Victor shook his friend's hand once more, and then they said, Goodbye. When Jim left Victor looked at the pictures again. He tried to think what to do next. Then he heard the telephone ring. It was Jim again. Victor answered immediately. Listen, friend, with this vacation I forgot to tell you one thing. Mario and his mistress are meeting at the restaurant tomorrow at 7 p.m. I even know which table they'll be sitting at. It's away from all the other tables, but I was able to book another table closer to them. I think you can hear something there. I wasn't going to go there, but for some reason I arranged it anyway. If you want, you can come to this restaurant, sit next to them and listen to what they're talking about. There's a table reserved under my name. Think for yourself, maybe you'll need it. Bye! And Jim passed out. Of course, Victor took advantage of the offer. The next day he was already at the restaurant at 6.30 p.m. He ordered himself a fancy dinner and told the waiter that he didn't like to be rushed. After ordering, he began to look around, neither Mario nor his mistress was there yet. Victor waited patiently. At 6.55 p.m. Mario appeared. He was exquisitely dressed. He looked at the time through his spectacles and sat down at a table. At 7.05 p.m. his mistress appeared. The woman looked chic. She walked across the room with her head held high. Her gait was so unusual. She wiggled her hips so much that it might have seemed like she was doing it on purpose. She had a beautiful, smooth face. It was clear at once that she was meticulously groomed. She didn't have a single wrinkle, though she was older than Mario. The woman approached the table and stopped. Mario jumped up and immediately grabbed her hand and rushed to kiss her. Cindy. My love. I have missed you very much. I haven't seen you for three days. It is an unbearable agony not to see you for so long. Cindy condescendingly gave wood for her hand and then wrenched it from his palms. I told you it was a forced measure. I had personal matters of my own. And I had to go away. Now I'm back. Mario pushed back a chair for her to sit down. Then he sat down himself. How I wish your private affairs were my private affairs. How I wish we still had things in common that you and I would never be apart. I have suggested to you so many times that I should move in with you. We've been together so long that we can get along. My darling. Cindy raised one eyebrow. Victor recognized that expression immediately. It was the woman who was taking advantage of Mario. And she had absolutely no need to get together with him. Victor suspected that this woman had once been married to a rich man and she had managed to get herself some of his fortune. Now she simply took advantage of men, taking what she needed from them. She was no longer interested in men as life partners or companions. Mario was not one of those who could turn Cindy's head. So she just went out with him, according to her plan. 
Don't make me mad, Mario. If you bring it up again now, I'll turn around and leave. I'm warning you, you'll never see me again. I'll never speak to you again. That I guarantee. Mario made a pitiful face and mumbled ingratiatingly. Of course, my precious. I'm sorry. I won't talk about it anymore. I'm ready to wait for you forever, when you're ready for anything, you'll tell me. Won't you? And I'll keep quiet, and I won't bring it up again. And I promise. Cindy answered nothing. She wiped her hands with a damp napkin. A waiter came over. Cindy took the menu in her hands and started to order. Mario did not say a word. He kept his eyes on his mistress. When it was done, Cindy leaned back and looked intently at Mario. What can you tell me? Any news? Mario shrugged and shook his head. No, unfortunately. The realtor said he couldn't assess the house without seeing the inside. Cindy rolled her eyes. I have to teach you everything. And what kind of a realtor puts conditions on his client? He should be kicked out. He's not the right person for us. Find someone else who can evaluate houses by their appearance. You should be taught everything. Mario was embarrassed and then asked timidly, maybe I should tell her everything? Let her know that I want to sell the house. Maybe she'll move out on her own and we can sell the house without any trouble. If I tell her everything, she can let a realtor in. It's not like she can do anything. Cindy frowned. Mario, are you really that stupid or are you just pretending? Don't you know you can't tell her anything? She can sue you. And she could have a showdown. Everything we have to hide will come out. And that won't be good for you. It could go wrong. And then you'll wish you hadn't told her. Mark my words. Women can do desperate things when it comes to their children. If she feels you're leaving your daughter with nothing, she'll become fiercely protective of her rights. She has them, as unfortunate as it may be. Victor listened intently to their conversation without missing a word. Well, there was the answer to all his questions. Mario's own sister had absolutely nothing to do with it. She probably doesn't even know what her brother is doing. Mario's mistress is in control here. She manipulates him however she wants. And when she gets what she wants, she'll easily get rid of him. And then what do we do? asked Mario, keeping his gaze on his mistress. Cindy sipped her wine, then set her glass on the table. She pondered a little, and then slowly said, We're doing it the way we planned it. Don't say a word to your sister. If she doesn't know about the apartment, just don't say anything. And the house will sell, somehow make everything so that the buyer will not even come to see the house. We just need to find another realtor we can pay. And he won't care what the inside of the house looks like. You gotta know how to find the right people, Mario. Mario listened to his mistress, holding his breath. Victor looked at him in disgust. How could Shelley be married to such a man? Did she not know what he was really like? Had she never noticed that he was corrupt, deceitful, hypocritical? Did she not know that he had been with another woman? How could that be? Victor had to eat dinner and dessert through sheer force because he wanted to hear everything they talked about. But after they discussed plans for the apartment and for the house, they began to eat dinner and talk about distracted topics. They didn't talk about anything else serious all evening. And when they left at 9 p.m. Victor paid and left after them 15 minutes later. The next day Victor called Shelley. He told her everything. She was shocked. She couldn't believe he had a mistress. He couldn't do that to me. He couldn't. How could he cheat on me with Gail? How could he leave us with nothing? And all the while behind our backs he was having an affair with this woman. Who was she? How long had she been with my husband? How did they meet? How long has he been seeing her? She pelted Victor with questions, but he couldn't answer them. Look, Shelley, I don't know what to tell you. I'm just a realtor. And as it happens, I happen to be involved in this case. But I'll do anything I can to help you. 
I need to find Mario's own sister. And I want to tell her everything. She's got to know that he's going behind her back to take over everything. I don't even know what she is. Maybe she doesn't care. Or maybe she's with him after all. Or maybe she'll just sue him and take his apartment, his car. I'm already afraid to think what Gail has in store for us. It's going to be okay. I won't leave you in the lurch, Shelly, promised Victor. As they said, goodbye, Shelly wondered. The adventure continues. Now they were in danger again. If Victor fails, soon Shelly will lose this house. Gail would find herself on the street. In the evening, Rebecca arrives. She saw that Shelly had no face. And Rebecca made her tell her everything. What a bastard. I could have killed him with my own hands. That's quite a trick to pull. Oh, I'd pull that Cindy who bosses him around like that by the hair. She wouldn't have a single strand of hair left. Why do you have to go to all this trouble? Can't you just have things left alone? I don't know, Rebecca. I don't know. But I'm really sick of it all. I'm just on edge. I'm ready to just pack my things and go anywhere and never hear from my ex-husband again. This house won't be mine anyway. I won't be able to live here very soon. They'll just throw me out on the street with Gail. Rebecca shook her head in shock and took Shelley's hand. No, I won't let you leave. This is your home, this is your job. Gail goes to kindergarten, your friends are here. We'll all help you. We won't leave you. If the worst happens, it's not a problem anyway. If anything, I'll take you to my place. We'll all fit in at my place. And I don't take no for an answer. Do you hear me? But I won't let you leave. Just so you know. Shelley cried with tenderness. He had never had such devoted friends, and she was glad to have met such a friend here. Victor said about looking for Mario's sister. It did not prove easy. Mario's sister lived in another city. Paula really had no idea what her brother was doing. When Victor called her, he introduced himself. Paula wondered what he wanted from her. He said that this was not a phone call and that he would like to meet her in person. Paula agreed. Victor took a train ticket that same day, and in the evening he was on his way. He arrived late, so he checked into a hotel room. He took a shower, had a snack and fell fast asleep, and in the morning he called Paula. She told him the address and asked him to come over. An hour later Victor was already at her place. Paula met him and showed him into her office. Victor was very surprised. He had not thought that Mario's sister was rich. And she was, judging by her huge house and luxurious furnishings. So it wasn't Mario who sent you to me? Paula asked. Victor shook his head. No, I came myself. This is my personal initiative. Paula looked at him nonchalantly. Victor saw the outward resemblance between brother and sister. But that must have been it. And why are you taking this initiative, asked Paula again. Victor was slightly embarrassed, but then decided to confess. I'm very sorry about Shelley, his ex-wife, and Gail, your niece. Paula was genuinely surprised. Gail? Your niece? I have a niece? Wow, Mario didn't tell me that. Victor realized that Mario had fooled absolutely everyone. Yes, you have a niece. And Mario kicked his daughter out of the apartment with his wife. He said that you and he decided to sell that apartment and split the money in half. Is that true? Paula slowly shook her head. No, that's not true. We weren't going to sell anything. I didn't know that this apartment was an inheritance from my grandmother. He didn't say that. He said there was only the house in the village, and we would decide what to do with it later. I didn't insist on dividing the inheritance. I don't need the money. And I don't need it at all. I just wanted to connect with him, to be brother and sister again. I certainly didn't want him to kick his wife and daughter out on my behalf. What kind of meanness is that? 
How could he do this to his family? And what does his ex-wife and my niece think of me now? Victor told Paula many more things to keep her informed. She listened to him and nodded. Then she rose from her seat. She walked around her desk and approached Victor, holding out her hand to him, she said, I am very grateful to you for coming and opening my eyes. Everything will be under my control from now on. You can trust me. I won't forgive him now, and you don't have to worry about my niece and my brother's ex-wife. I won't hurt them. They got hurt for no reason at all. I will make my brother pay for everything. Victor shook her hand, and she walked him to the exit. Victor drove to the hotel. The train back wasn't until tonight, and Victor decided to call Shelly for now. As he waited for her to answer his call, he thought about how quickly this girl had captured his heart and that he would do anything to make her happy. And he would punish anyone who hurt her. He told Shelly briefly that he had been to Sister Mario's and that he had told Paula everything. And he reassured Shelly that her ex-husband's sister wasn't going to hurt her. Shelly thanked Victor from the bottom of her heart. In the evening Victor went home. A couple of days later the showdown began. Mario did not suspect a thing. He made plans to continue his business with Cindy. And he dreamed that after he sold the house and the apartment, he would ask Cindy to marry him and he would throw all the money from the house sale at her feet. It would be his wedding present. Mario thought that Cindy would eventually agree to marry him, live with him, and have children together. Mario also liked Cindy's house very much. He hoped to live with her in her house. He would sell his possessions and drive her beautiful car. Oh, what a life he would have. After a while, however, his sister called. It was unexpected. Paula said she knew about the apartment and the house in the village. She began to shout, outraged, and then said she was going to sue. She will insist that all the property be divided, and she will demand compensation for his lies and deceit. She wants her apartment in the city to go to her, but only his house in the country. No matter how hard Mario tries to prove that he was not involved in any fraud, he fails. Paula said he would be subpoenaed and then hung up. Mario immediately started calling Cindy. When she picked up the phone, she was very displeased. I sincerely hope you're on the verge of life and death, because otherwise I'm going to strangle you myself. Why the hell are you calling me when I'm at the beauty parlor? I have a lot to do. I warned you. Cindy, something terrible has happened. I had to talk to you right away. Paula, my sister, found out. I don't know how it happened. Who told her? How did she find out? She knows everything. You know, she's gonna sue me. She's gonna sue me for half of everything. It's over. Cindy, what do we do? What do we do? Tell me, how should I behave? Cindy, don't be silent. Cindy squeezed the receiver. How she was tired of this Mario. He was so much trouble. And she didn't like solving problems. She preferred her problems to be solved by other people. She didn't want other people's problems. She'd put up with his bullshit for too long. It was time to get rid of him. And it had to be done now, while he was still innocent. Otherwise, she'd be accused of something along with him. You know, Mario, don't call me anymore. It's over between us. I don't know what you're trying to tell me. I'm not interested at all. Mario was shocked. What? What are you talking about? Cindy. What do you mean you don't understand? You told me all this. You told me how to do it so my sister would get nothing and my wife would get nothing. You're the one who taught me everything. I did it all for you, for our love, for our future. Cindy got angry. What nonsense are you talking? I didn't tell you anything and I didn't give you any advice. What nonsense are you talking? I don't care about your sister and your wife. I don't care about them. I didn't teach you anything. Why are you making all this up? What kind of love are we talking about? We met a couple of times, had a good time, that's all. What kind of future are you talking about? 
I never promised you anything. I don't love you and I never have. You're just out of your mind. I warned you. Don't call me again. Otherwise I'll sue you for harassment and threats. There you go. I advise you not to harass me anymore, or it will end very badly for you. Just so you know, and she hung up. Mario held the phone to his ear for a while longer, listening for beeps. Then he put the phone away and sat down in his chair with a silly expression on his face. What was he going to do now? Two months had passed. During that time Shelley heard no news of her ex-husband. Victor called occasionally, but he did not say anything definite. Shelley really wanted to see Victor. She was afraid to admit that she missed him. She just assured herself that she wanted to ask him about his trip to visit Mario's sister, but she was afraid to say the invitation out loud. And he himself had not taken the initiative to visit her. Autumn came. It was Gail's birthday in September, and Shelley was getting ready for it. Gail was turning five the first little anniversary. Shelley and Rebecca decided to throw a party in the yard. They decided to invite the entire kindergarten group to the party. Shelley and Rebecca planned entertainment and treats. Rebecca was going to bake lots of delicious food. And Shelley was going to buy treats at the store. She also wanted to order balloons from the city. But that would have been too expensive. So the kindergarten teacher decided to help them. She gave her 30 ordinary balloons. The day before her birthday, she had to blow them all up. Rebecca said they could do it together. Anyway, Shelley's head was full of many things, and she stopped thinking for a while about her future, about the house in the village, about Victor. Gail's birthday came. Everything was going just fine. She and Rebecca had managed to inflate the balloons, the presents were ready, the treats too. Everyone was waiting for the party to begin. Shelley congratulated her daughter, then did her hair and put on a beautiful dress. Rebecca came in. She kissed the girl and gave her a gift. And then Shelley and Rebecca began to take the treats outside and put them on the tables. And half an hour later, the first guests began to arrive. There had never been so much noise and fun in the house. Gail was so happy. She looked at everything around her with admiration, and Shelley knew that she had done everything right. The time flew by unnoticed. The children had calmed down a bit after the raucous feast. They sat down at the table and began to eat the treats. Shelley was able to take a little break because Rebecca had taken over some of the responsibilities. Shelley went inside to wash some of the dishes. As she washed the plates, she saw through the window some strange woman standing near the fence. Shelley had never seen her before. Shelley watched her, and the woman watched the children. Then she stared at Gail. Shelley frowned. She wiped her hands with a towel, then walked out into the yard, walking to the front door, she asked, Hello? Are you looking for someone? The woman looked at her carefully. She looked her over from head to toe and muttered, Yes, I'm looking for someone. You're Shelley, I take it, the woman's voice was very pleasant, but Shelley still felt a kind of unease. Goosebumps ran down her arms. Shelley wrapped her arms around herself. Yes, my name is Shelley. Are you here for one of the children? The woman shook her head. Shelley sensed more of the impending disaster. And then she realized that the woman had a familiar face. What's your name? She asked Shelley quietly. The woman looked at her for a long time and then answered quietly. My name is Paula. They were both silent for a long time. There were shouts from children and parents. But it was as if Paula and Shelley heard nothing. They looked at each other. Are you my ex-husband's sister? Shelley finally asked. The woman nodded. Shelley sighed convulsively. Have you come to tell me to vacate this house? Have you come to kick me and Gail out? Shelley was sure I had. But, to her surprise, Paula shook her head. No, you didn't, how could I do that? No, I came to meet you and my niece, and to wish her a happy birthday. Shelley was very surprised, but at the same time she was greatly relieved. 
so everything would be all right. As long as no one kicked them out. Shelly nodded and opened the front door. Well, come on in. Paula, I'll introduce you to Gail. We'd love for you to join our party. Paula came in and immediately told her, may I speak to you in private first? And then everything else. Shelly led Paula in. They were silent for a while. Paula looked at the interior of the room. It's very cozy. I like it. Shelly nodded. Thank you. They were silent again. You know, I always wanted to have a big family, but I never managed to make my own. I was married. My husband and I divorced. I couldn't have children. That became a stumbling block between us. I wanted to take a child from an orphanage, but my husband couldn't accept it. He left me. I never took the baby. I never got married again. So I live alone, with no one to do anything nice for me and no one to discuss the future with. And when I found out I had a niece, I was terribly happy. Words can't describe my joy. I had dreamed so badly of meeting her. I really hope that she will communicate with me, that she will come to visit me. If she likes me, I really hope that you will not prevent me from communicating with her. Shelley smiled slightly and nodded. Of course I won't. You're Gail's own aunt. How can I forbid you to communicate? It's out of the question. Paula smiled, too, and breathed a sigh of relief. That's wonderful. That's just wonderful. Thank you, and immediately Paula reached into her bag. She pulled out a large white envelope and held it out to Shelley. What is it? She asked Shelley in surprise as she took the envelope in her hands. Paula smiled. It's Gail's birthday present. Open the envelope. You need to look at it, because she won't understand anything yet. Shelley opened the envelope and pulled out some papers. After reading carefully what it said, she marveled. It can't be. Is this true? Are you kidding? Paula smiled and shook her head. What kind of joke is this? No, I'm not joking. This is my birthday present to my niece. Shelley shook her head in shock. I don't know what to say. Even I didn't expect this. You just shocked me. Paula walked over to Shelley and took her hand. You don't have to say anything. This is the gift I decided to give. I don't regret anything. Now, if you don't mind, introduce me to your daughter. I'm burning with excitement to chat with her. Shelley smiled and nodded. She folded the papers into envelopes, hid them in the closet, and then she led Paula outside. Gail. Come here. The girl ran up to her mother. Meet Gail, this is your own Aunt Paula. She has come to meet you and make friends with you. Gail looked at the stranger and smiled. Paula smiled, too. Gail held out her pen and said, Aunt Paula, come, let me show you my presents. I have so many today that I will be opening them all year by myself. I need help. Shelley watched her daughter and her ex-husband's sister with a smile. What a surprise this is turning out to be. Shelley looked toward the house and thought about the papers Paula had given her. They were the deeds to the town apartment. Paula had obtained possession of the apartment through the courts, and then she had registered the apartment with her niece, Gail. Now the city apartment belonged to Shelley's daughter, and they were no longer homeless. Even if this house didn't work out, they now had somewhere to live. However, that was also the bad news. It meant that Shelley's ex-husband had gotten the house. And now he would certainly not tolerate her living here with their daughter. And he would find a way to kick her out. What's there to find? He'll just come and kick them out. They will have to give up their settled life again and leave, go back to the city. What bad luck. The party was over. Everyone's gone. Rebecca and Paula were the only ones left. They helped Shelley clean up and put everything away, and then Paula wanted to put Gail to bed. Shelley didn't mind. Rebecca went home. Shelley sat in the kitchen, thinking about all that had happened. 
Paula put her niece to bed and then left. She and Shelley exchanged phone numbers and promised each other that they would stay in touch at all times. A week passed. Shelley waited every day to hear from her husband. She was afraid he would come, personally kick them out of the house. And Shelley didn't want to leave. She was already so used to life in the country, and she was so used to all the people around her. She liked everything. And she liked this house, too. But Shelley was even more afraid that Mario would hurt his daughter again. The daughter had already realized that her father had forgotten all about her. Gail had already stopped asking why daddy didn't visit her, why he didn't call. At her birthday party, she hadn't even mentioned him, as if she didn't have a father. And Shelley even calmed down a little. But now if Mario came and told him to clean up, she just didn't know how Gail might react. Shelley was making dinner and then the phone rang. She picked up the cell phone, went pale, her hands were shaking. It was Mario. This was the moment she'd been dreading. Now he was going to tell them to get out of this house. He hadn't even come to tell them in person, he decided to explain everything over the phone. She wished she hadn't picked up the phone, but it was a childish attitude. She couldn't avoid this conversation. It was better to find out everything right away, and then move on with her life. So Shelly answered the phone. Hello, Shelly. How are you? What's new, Mario's voice sounded a little oily. What do you want, Mario, she asked Shelly indifferently. Why so rude to me? Aren't you glad to hear me? How is Gail doing? Shelly was ready to tell him to go to hell. She could hardly contain herself. Mario, what do you want? Speak up. I have a lot to do, she answered rudely. Mario laughed and answered angrily, Nothing, soon you won't have anything to do. I have sold the house. Do you understand? It's not my house now. And it was never your house. The new owner will be here soon. He'll kick you out. You'll be homeless, like that tramp who got you fired from the nursing home. Do you understand me? Serves you right. Shelley almost choked. He had sold the house. God, what had he done? How could he? And his daughter? Doesn't he think about her at all? You just, Mario, robbed your daughter of her home. How could you do that? Don't you care about her at all? Mario was silent, and then he answered, sort of. Okay, good luck, Shelley, and he hung up. And Shelley sat up and shook her head. That's just not possible. So they would have to leave everything and move after all. Pretty soon they would be evicted. But a week went by and no one showed up at their door. Then another week went by. And silence. Shelley got tired of waiting for something. Rebecca saw that her friend was worried. Naturally, Shelley told her right away. Rebecca was aware of everything. You're going to drive yourself crazy, Shelley. Stop thinking about it. Live your life. No one touches you, that's all right. But Shelley shook her head. I can't do that, you know, Rebecca. This house doesn't even belong to my ex-husband anymore. It belongs to a total stranger. I can't do this. I already shudder at every sound. I'm on the edge. I'd better pack my things, Gail's things, and we'll get out of here without waiting to be kicked out. Rebecca fluttered her arms. What are you saying? Don't let me hear you say that again. I won't let you do that. You're not going anywhere. No. We will fight to the end. As soon as the new owner arrives, we'll demand that he sell the house to you. It doesn't matter if there's no money, we'll think of something. Paula will help you. And then you'll pay back her death. There's always a way. Shelley, death can't be changed or fixed. And everything else is always possible. We have to find a way out, Rebecca persuaded Shelley to stay. But the girl was still troubled, disgusted, and disgusting. A week later, a car pulled up to the house. At first Shelley was frightened that it was the new owner, but then she recognized Victor's car. 
and she was terribly excited to see him. It had been so long since he had come, she thought he had forgotten them. She went out to meet him. When he saw her, he smiled. And in his hands was some kind of folder. Hello, Victor. Why didn't you come to see us? Gail often asked about you. I didn't know what to say. I told her you were busy. Hello, Shelley. Yes, indeed, I had very important business. I couldn't get away. I couldn't in any way, but now I'm free. I've decided to come and see you. Shelley smiled. She was glad to see him. Honestly, I have so much to tell you, Victor. You won't believe what happened. Victor smiled, too. Then why don't you invite me to tea and tell me what happened? And then I'll tell you something too. I have news, too. Shelley quickly made tea and then began to tell Victor about everything that had happened recently. She told him in great detail. He smiled as he looked at her. She was so happy and so sincere, but when she started talking about her ex-husband and the fact that he had sold someone's house, her smile faded. Rebecca says I should just sit and wait. And I wanted to drop everything and leave without waiting for the new owners. What do you think I should do? I don't know what to do next. I don't want to leave the village. I love living here so much. I've started a new life and I love it. Victor smiled slightly as he looked at her. He knew he had done the right thing. What would happen next, he tried not to think about it, but he hadn't made the wrong choice. That's for sure. You don't have to go, Shelley. You don't have to go anywhere. Shelley stared at him in silence, then said quietly, Why? Victor was quiet, and then he put the file in front of her. Because this house belongs to you. There was silence. Shelley didn't look at the documents he moved toward her. She looked him in the eye. What do you mean? I don't understand. I don't understand anything. Shelley, I'm the one who bought this house from your husband. I just bought it from him without explaining anything. And now the house is yours. I gave you back what is rightfully yours. This is your home, Shelley, and you can stay here legally. Now you can do whatever you want. And you don't have to be afraid of him anymore. You won't be harassed or kicked out. You can live here in complete peace. Shelley sobbed. It finally dawned on her what he had said. She began to tremble. Why did you do that? Victor, I don't understand anything. Victor wanted to say something that he just felt sorry for her, that he couldn't stand the injustice, that he had to help her because it was his duty. But none of this was entirely true. He had to confess it to her. Finally Victor looked intently into her eyes and whispered, Because I love you, Shelley. Shelley opened her mouth in surprise, and then she covered her face with her hands and cried. She cried with confusion and happiness. Six months passed. Shelley stood in front of the mirror, stretched out like an arrow. She never took her eyes off her reflection, only occasionally trying to raise her hand to touch her hair. Put your hands down. Don't move. Who am I talking to? There's still a little bit left. I'll be done soon. It's your fault. Who loses weight before a wedding? Now I have to make this dress right for you. That's it, now you're doomed to call me on my wedding night." Shelley laughed and blushed. Don't be silly, Rebecca. We'll manage that dress ourselves somehow. Of course you can. Of course you can. How else could you not? Okay, stay still, don't move. Rebecca went about her business for another couple of minutes, and Shelley continued to examine herself. She thought it was all a dream, but she knew that if she pinched herself now, she would feel pain. And that meant it was all real. Today she was getting married. She is marrying the man she loved with all her heart and who has done more for her in a few months than anyone has ever done for her. Yes, Shelley was marrying Victor, the man who had helped her get justice, the man who had not abandoned her in trouble, and had given her not only a home but also his heart. 
After Victor confessed his love for her, they talked at length. She confessed that she had feelings for him, too, and then he stayed the night. And it was the best night of her life. He proposed to her, but Shelley didn't immediately say yes. She was afraid of changing her life so drastically. Until a couple of days ago, she had thought that she would soon have to leave the village. And now she was already living in her own house and had been asked to marry. And only her answer determines her future life. Gail grew very fond of Victor. She just loved talking to him. And when he was their guest, she constantly took him into the yard, showed him something and told him something, and then solemnly declared to her mother that these were her and Victor's secrets. And secrets are not to be told. Shelley saw her daughter blossom when Victor paid her attention. Yes, Gail missed her father. And once Shelley realized that the best father she could have was Victor, she realized that she would marry him. Yes, she wants her daughter to have the best father in the world. And she wants her to have the best husband in the world. And that's all they can find at Victor. And Shelley said she was ready to marry him. And now, looking at herself, Shelley was smiling. She had done everything right in life. She had never once gone wrong with her principles. She had always been kind, she had never wronged anyone. She was honest not only with others, but also with herself. She did not deceive her husband. Unlike him, she could look people in the eye without being embarrassed. And that was worth a lot. And now she has her best friend standing beside her, sewing her dress to make her beautiful for her wedding. And this woman has helped her so much. She had supported her so many times, so Shelley thought of her as her sister already. And there are already guests gathering in the courtyard who are genuinely happy for her. And soon she would be the wife of the best man in the world. And Shelley realized that she had never been happier. And she knew that she would be even happier in the future, because only the best ones are waiting for her next to Victor. There could be no other. Rebecca uncurled and sighed, looking carefully at her friend's dress. She shook her hands in satisfaction. Perfect. As if it were. You're lucky I know how to sew, my friend, or you'd have your back covered. Shelley smiled and held out her hands. Thank you. You're the best friend in the world. Rebecca pretended to wipe away a tear and hugged her. Oh, I'm going to cry so hard. Shelley held her friend tightly to her and said, When I marry you off, I'm going to make fun of you, too. I'll warn you right away. Rebecca cringed. Oh, what are you talking about? I'm not getting married anymore. What did I forget there? Shelley held up her index finger and threatened her friend. That's what I said, too. Rebecca, that's exactly what I said. Have you forgotten? So don't say that. You're still young, and you've got a long way to go, too. Rebecca bit her tongue and pretended to be preoccupied with her veil. So, are you ready? asked Rebecca. Shelley nodded. Yes, she was ready to get married. And it would happen in just a few minutes. Yes, she replied. Then let's go, my sister. Let's go, Shelley replied. They held hands and left the room, closing the door tightly behind them. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.